I would like to welcome all of you in our journey uh, in ocular trauma from anterior segment to posterior segment. And first of all, many thanks to our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Hassan Murtada from Cairo, Egypt, Professor Ashraf Shahrao from Alexandria, Egypt, Professor Chanjit Mittal from India, Professor Matteo Polini from Italy, Professor Ashraf Armea from Cairo, Egypt, Professor Louis from Cairo, Egypt, Professor Basim Faiz uh, from Cairo, Egypt, and me, Maggit Gerges, and it's honor to me to moderate this journey. Uh, let us start with uh, uh, some cookies in ocular trauma for decision making, and I would like to, uh, uh, to make this uh, uh, first uh, sessions uh, in an interactive way. So I need the uh, uh, opinion of our distinguished speakers as well as the, uh, I will ask the uh, attendee uh, to uh, share with us our opinion. So let us start with the uh, first uh, slides before the big show of our ocular, uh, uh, our videos for ocular trauma. So let us start with uh, uh, with this uh, slides when uh, when uh, we faced with the patients with um, with uh, uh, ocular trauma with uh, open eye injury. So uh, my questions to the uh, TND first, and then we will comment with our distinguished speakers. How urgency? How urgency is the initial surgery in open eye surgery? Let us talk the, uh, uh, the opinion of our attendee. Is it within 24 hours? Is it within 48 hours? Or within one week? Or within two weeks? I will uh, post the polling. Uh, <coughs> Uh, you can see the my screen of polling, yes. Okay. Uh, the uh, 90, 96 percent of our attendee uh, vote within 24 hours. I think uh, all of us uh, accept this. So let us uh, start with uh, Dr. Hassan. What do you think, Dr. Hassan? What how the urgency will be in the initial surgery in open eye injury? Um, I think it should be done. Uh, the primary repair should be done um, as soon as possible, preferably. Uh, soon after the um, the occurrence of the of the injury, so within the 24 hours, uh, this is very important to close the um, the globe, uh, maintain uh, the ocular pressure, and um, as a safeguard against uh, infections. Um, uh, so it should be done as as soon as possible. I think all of us agree this. If anyone has another comment. I think all of us agree this opinion. And the next and the next slides asking about the optimum time for second surgery if needed. If it is immediate or after one week or after two weeks or after one month. Let's start pulling from uh, our attendee. This is uh, the initial surgery, sorry. This is pool uh, two. Yes. Okay. Let us start sharing with our attendee the timing of the initial, the second surgery if needed after the primary closure of the uh, uh, penetrating trauma. If it is immediate, after one week, after two weeks, and or after one month. 
Okay, uh, I think uh, the results mainly after two weeks and uh, for myself, I agree this exactly, but I may ask uh, Dr. Ashraf Sharawi, what's your opinion for about, uh, about the timing of secondary intervention if needed after primary closure of the globe? Uh, well, there are some indications for early intervention, as if you have an open lens, open capsule, and the lens matter in the anterior chamber. This, if you leave it for two weeks, then this would induce secondary glaucoma with all its consequences on the corneal edema and the corneal structure. Again, the old faith that two weeks is very important to wait for spontaneous PVD for secondary intervention for vitrectomy is now not very valid because we have very strong technical uh, tools that helps us to detach the posterior hyaloid and to be sure about that even in young individuals by staining and instrumentation. So we can intervene, intervene earlier than two weeks other than the old faith. If you see that the eye is quiet, there is no much corneal edema, no secondary glaucoma, then you can intervene even earlier than the two weeks. Uh, Dr. Matteo? Yeah, I agree. Uh, usually, it depends on the trauma and depends on the type of surgery. But uh, mostly, in my opinion, after one week is indicated for the second surgery. Okay, Dr. Wayne? Well, I usually try to intervene as early as possible. It may even uh, be done during the primary repair of the uh, rupture globe. But if I have to wait, I think I wouldn't wait more than one week uh, because uh, once I have a restored uh, globe integrity by the repair, uh, I can operate on the various pathology that is there, whether in vitreous or the retina, and to manage the tissue while they are still fresh without developing fibros fibrosis or any proliferative uh, process. Maybe I think this helps to intervene as early as possible. Dr. Hassan? Um, yes, I, I agree with you, but um, in this specific case, the, uh, there is a large corneal wound, and my concern is that the corneal wound is not tight enough and, it, uh, the, and there is not enough time for um, some coaptation or healing to occur. So my concern is that during um, secondary intervention, um, uh, by doing a vitrectomy or whatever, the, the edges may uh, gap. And so you have to re-suture again. So I think within the first two weeks, uh, we have to do um, CT, we have to do ultrasound. Uh, sometimes you do uh, electrophysiologic tests if the, um, the vision is poor. And um, uh, in my opinion, in this specific case, the cornea will be clearer, the wound will be um, more uh, tightly coapted, and two weeks, uh, I think, is a reasonable, is a reasonable time, 10 to 10 weeks, 10 to 15 days. I think in this specific case, with no lens and with a large, long uh, cornea balloon. Okay, Dr. Sanjit? Uh, I agree with Dr. Hassan. I think I'll wait for 10 to 15 days just because one, it allows the cornea to get clearer. But in cases if there is a retinal detachment or in ruptured lens, definitely we have to move in early. Okay, Dr. Ashraf Armey. As uh, from the anterior segment point of view, if uh, I don't have a lens uh, capsule opened uh, and have a cataract, I can wait. Uh, from two to three weeks until the inflammation subsides and the wound in the cornea uh, getting better. But if there is uh, open uh, anterior capsule and the lens matter is already in the anterior chamber, I'm going to uh, operate within uh, the first week after uh, uh, healing of the inflammation. If it's anterior and posterior and there is a posterior problem, so it, uh, it, not, it will not uh, less uh, within one week to 10 days, you should operate. Professor? I think two weeks is ideal for this case uh, to allow good coaptation of the corneal wound and to do uh, further intervention um, as from my anterior segment point of view. And uh, there is no lens, uh, as you can see from the first picture, so no need for immediate intervention in the, uh, in the second time. So two weeks. Uh, 
Okay. May, I, may I ask you, is this patient is fake or a fake it? Or, so the, uh, this, patient, this patient, especially, I will display his, uh, his video later on in this meeting, but this patient uh, is a fake and the lens was removed in primary surgery. Okay, so I, I may add that during the primary repair, you have to uh, cut any vitreous incarcerated in the, the wound sure. and uh, also remove some of the, um, of the hemorrhage that may be present because this um, because removing this scaffold for proliferation may retard the, um, the proliferation of cells into the eye. So the stoke or the, uh, the incarceration has to be uh, relieved during the primary repair. Yes. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, do we ask for ultrasound and or CT in the open eye injury from the start? And if so, when? Okay, the result is mandatory in all cases. Uh, let us start again the comments of our speakers. Uh, for me, I think uh, it's mandatory, oh, okay, but uh, in open eye injury, the eye uh, usually is soft, and so I usually postpone the ultrasound and satisfied with CT from the start and delayed the uh, request for ultrasound. Uh, it is mandatory, yes, but uh, first with ultrasound and then by CT. Let's start with Dr. Hassan. I think after uh, one week, the, you can perform uh, ultrasound. Of course, CT can be performed um, earlier, can be performed on the second day or third day of uh, repair of the uh, uh, primary repair. Uh, but um, both should be done. And um, the uh, operator with the ultrasound is instructed that this is an open globe injury and um, he has to be cautious uh, during, do, uh, during the procedure. But both should be performed. Dr. Matteo? Well, um, we, we usually prefer to close immediately the eye before sending the patient to CT scan. Also, sometimes you have to wait for CT scan, so we just close the wound, and then. Uh, but uh, it depends, of course, on the also on the situation and the time of the day. It depends how much do we have to wait for the surgic surgery for the surgical room. Anyway, um, I agree with you about uh, you ultrasound. So ultrasound, uh, uh, sometimes we avoid it because uh, if we have open injury, the eye is soft. And uh, so ultrasound uh, cannot be good. But CT scan is very useful, especially for detecting, for detecting the presence of intraocular foreign body. So it uh, can help. But just for the wound repair, uh, it depends on the situation because uh, also how much uh, the, the wound is big. If we, if we have just a small uh, corneal wound, for example, we just can close the eye. Of course, but if we suspect uh, intraocular foreign body from the history, we, we ask for a CT scan, of course. Okay, let's move. Uh, when we order uh, uh, electrophysiology of the eye after ocular trauma, uh, uh, if we uh, no need for it at all or in severe traumatizing eye, let us ask our attendee when we order electrophysiology of the eye after ocular trauma, if there is no need at all for these tests, or okay, or we request it in severe traumatizing eye only. Okay, uh, and fifty nine percent in severe traumatizing eye only. No need in all cases. Let us ask Dr. Ashraf Sharawi, what's your opinion about this uh, issue? I think for VRG and VEP, it looks like the certificate of death for the eye. Yes. I don't like to order it because it gives a false impression that there is no hope for the surgery. I think the light perception and the light projection and the color, color discrimination as a clinical tool is much, much more helpful for the decision of surgery. 
uh, the patient who gets uh, a flat ERG or VAP, nobody would dare to touch him again, although he may have some potentials or hopes for vision restoration after surgery. Yes, Dr. Wael? I agree completely with Dr. Ashraf Sharawi. I actually, I don't rely on ERG, VAP, or even the ultrasound in some cases. I think every trauma case uh, reserves, uh, deserves a chance to uh, intervene, of course, after a detailed informed uh, consent uh, with the patient. Even if no PL, we have seen some trauma surgeons in the world talking about uh, no light perception cases for whom they operated and they could achieve something. Uh, I think we wouldn't rely on your GOV. Tanjit? I, I may do a VEP when uh, I'm doubtful of the perception of the light. Sometimes the patient says he is having perception. Sometimes he says he's not. But I don't think ERG has got any value in decision making for a trauma case. Yeah. Uh, me, I agree. I agree too. Yeah, I guess, like to yes, Dr. Hassan. Uh, I think uh, it is important in the, in the pediatric age group when the patient cannot tell about um, his vision. He cannot tell whether he is seeing light or cannot see because. He is in pain, he is uh, crying. So I think doing um, uh, ERG and VEP in the pediatric age group, just to know the function of the, the retina and the optic nerve, I think this may be um, guiding during the course of treatment. I may add that if the foreign body inside the eye revealed by CT is coupled, this is an indication for very early interference, maybe within um, few days because of the reaction induced by the couple foreign bodies. So in trauma, there is no dogma. So we have to um, adapt our management according to the case. Yes. Make it. I agree totally, Dr. Hassan. Yes. Make it, please. Can you make the screen full screen, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, in full screen, uh, I, I couldn't see the... Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, and uh, in if secondary surgery is needed after primary repair and no PL, do you operate? Short questions. I ask the I ask the attendee. <laughs> I noticed that 50 50 arounds. <laughs> around half, okay. <laughs> around half. No, this is unusual. Depends on uh, the uh, uh, Yes, I, I think if after the repair, the vision is no perception of light, we may wait for some time and retest the vision. And usually, in some cases, uh, the vision may improve. Uh, so, and instead of no perception of light, after one week there is perception of light, and then there may be hand motion. So I think it is um, uh, it is not uh, necessary that if it is no perception of light that we don't operate. Uh, so we have to wait and test the vision again. Uh, I mean, in this uh, in this uh, questions, uh, if no PL after I uh, after waiting after two, two weeks or more, or, or I mean, in other words, if I prepared him in the second interventions and I see that the vision is not improving, from no PL. Then I will do a VEP and ERG. And if it is subnormal? Subnormal, then I have to be uh, very conservative. I, I ask the patient, I let the patient understand the situation and should sign a consent a heavy consent that um, the chances are not as uh, when the vision is um, hand motion or per perception with good projection. When when I when I give up, Dr. Hassan, in patients with no BL and and, and ERG and VEB, uh, uh, market reduction showing market reduction. Uh, I may I may refrain from doing the surgery. For medical legal uh, reasons. 
Yes. Dr. Ashraf? Yeah. Dr. Ashraf uh, yeah, uh, for me, at any time, if the vision is no PL, there is no surgery. Because even if the patient is motivated and had a very heavy consent, after surgery, we won't remember this. We will ask okay. for vision. Okay, if it is not possible to reconstruct the eyeball at all, and inoculation is truly the only option, when do you recommend the, uh, this vigorous surgery and psychological trauma as well for the patients? Uh, let us see the, uh, uh, the attendee, the polling of attendee. Immediate or after one week or after one month or after two months. May I ask uh, anterior segment surgeons, Dr. Ashraf Armea, uh, prepare himself and Dr. Basim Faiz. <clears throat> okay, the result is uh, one week. The majority, 35%, one week. Let's ask uh, the crash of Armee. Uh, if the trauma is uh, completely uh, cannot be reconstructed at all, uh, by all means, and I have a, a open uvea and a totally eviscerated eye, I will go into an uh, uh, immediately uh, for the fear of the sympathetic ophthalmia. But if I can a um, little bit close the eye uh, till it becoming, I, I, can't, uh, I can feel that I can little bit close it. I can wait for a week, then do inoculation. But it, uh, as early as uh, possible, we should do it for the fear of the empathetic of thumb. Dr. Basim? Yes, I totally agree with you, Dr. Uh, Ashraf. Uh, if the globe can be repaired in the primary situation, I will go to close as much as I can from the globe. Uh, then I will do inoculation uh, if it is severely traumatized to for fear of sympathetic of some mites. But if it is uh, non repairable, I can't repair the globe, it is severely traumatized, and the vision is no PL, and many uh, content of the eye is out. So I will go immediately for inoculation to protect the other eye from sympathetic of some mites. Dr. Sanjit? First of all, I, uh, if the globe is not repairable, uh, I will definitely go back to the patient's attendance and patient once again after the surgery is over and then talk to him again that this thing cannot be repaired and there is a chance of sympathetic ophthalmia. But just for the fear of sympathetic ophthalmia, I'm not going to inoculate them. I will just wait for some time and see whether the patient develops any kind of visual uh, after Maybe just as we talked, sometimes the no PL eyes also turn to PL positive. And then we can again try it and uh, from uh, the surgery once again. But we have to explain to the patient once again and take a proper consent before inoculating the eye. So I'll not go immediately at the same time, but uh, definitely talk to the patient once again and then decide whether to inoculate or not. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Uh, uh, lens removal in surgery with intraocular foreign body, if lens is clear, do you, uh, do you accept removal of the lens if there is intraocular foreign body, if the lens is clear or no? Let us say uh, the opinion of our attendee. Okay, uh, let's ask uh, Dr. Hassan, what is your opinion about the lens removal uh, in case of intraocular foreign body, if the lens is clear? Um, well, Maggie, I, I mean, it depends on other factors. Um, if, the, if the lens is clear, as you said, and the patient is young, and the foreign body is a small foreign body, and there is the detachment, there is no detachment, or um, there is localized detachment to a then I would preserve the lens. But if the lens um, is clear, 
the foreign body is large or huge foreign body. There is detachment and, um, and there is signs of PVR, uh, and then or retinal incarceration. Then I may think uh, of uh, doing um, FACO and implanting an IOL in the same, uh, in the same uh, during the same uh, procedure. So it is not, um, the other factors should be considered. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Ashraf Sharawi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if there is any opacity in the lens that would jeopardize removal of the interocular foreign body or uh, fixing of a retinal detachment, I will go ahead and remove uh, the lens. There is no problem in that. Our primary air, uh, aim is to preserve uh, the posterior segment and to remove the foreign body. What's very critical in interocular foreign body, usually the foreign body, especially if small, are incarcerated in the area of the pars plana, inferiorly at six o'clock because of the gravity. And this area sometimes very difficult to reach the foreign body and to handle it efficiently in the presence of the lens. So if this is the case, I would remove the lens even if it's not cataractus. But if it's not coming through the lens and the lens is very clear, especially in young patients, I will pre preserve it. Okay, uh, let us start now the route of our journey, which is ball-to-ball -ball surgery in severely traumatizing eye from penetrating ocular trauma causing severe damage from the cornea to the retina. And the challenge in this situation will be great and double in the anterior and the posterior segment as well. Dr. Matteo accepts this challenge and will show us the tour route and how he managed this severely traumatizing eye. So can I ask Dr. Matteo to share uh, with us your experience? Okay, thank you again for this opportunity. So I will show you uh, my three cases. So I have three cases to present you with the pole-to-pole -pole approach in different severe traumas. So I'm sharing desktop. Okay. So my first case is a 38 years old male. He had a traumatic subluxated cataract with zonal dialysis and midriasis. As you can see, this is the pre-op situation. And you can see here the that, that was the, the beginning, so uh, total uh, um, la large subluxation of the uh, cataract, of the crystalline lens, and uh, midriasis. So the first time, the first surgery was uh, FACO, and I just removed uh, all the lens because um, the capsular bag was uh, uh, too much, uh, too damaged. So I couldn't use the capsular bag to implant the IOL. So I just removed all the capsular bag and uh, I tried to do a slip sliding knob technique, but it was impossible because the midriasis was uh, very old. Actually, this patient received the trauma 30 years before, when he was a kid, when he was uh, 13 years old. Now he's 38 years old. So uh, the reason, um, I, I don't know why he didn't have surgery when he was a kid, but um, after 30 years, the iris became rigid, became unelastic. So the iris became uh, um, uh, um, impossible to, to treat, to stretch. And so I tried to, to do iridoplasty, but uh, the, the iris tissue was so rigid, so fibrotic. Uh, Doctor Matteo, uh, yeah? Dr. Matteo, this is the this is the next this is the next stop. We we are um, uh, we are now asking you about the uh, uh, temporary cataract processes and uh, trauma from the cornea to the retina. Okay, okay, okay. So 
another case. So sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. So that was my my second case. Okay. So uh, this was this is uh, uh, another case, pole to pole surgery. So uh, fifty years old male. He presented like this, corneal wound with post-traumatic aniridia and aphakia. So, okay, first time surgery, corneal suture, immediate, of course. But uh, after uh, one week, we did uh, the second time surgery. So PK, penetrating keratoplasty and vitrectomy using temporary keratoprostasis and uh, vitrectomy because we also had the uh, lexated lens in vitreous chamber but the retina was flat. And the third time surgery, you, I will show you later, artificial iris implantation with IOL included, mm -hmm. with scleral fixation. So, video. So this is uh, the approach. You see the cornea after uh, the corneal uh, wound repair. So we prepare for the PK. So of course we have to remove the cornea because cornea was too damaged. And so this is a penetrating keratoplasty. And now I am using the temporary keratoprostasis by Eckert. You see, this is the TKP. And now I'm suturing, of course, the TKP to the sclera. And so I'm ready for the vitrectomy. I'm using 23 gauge vitrectomy. And you can see the lens dropped in the vitreous chamber. I am using uh, uh, triancinolone, of course, to stay in the vitreous. So with triancinolone, I can see all the vitreous much better. And now I'm, uh, I'm focusing on the crystalline lens to remove the dropped lens. So little by little, with the, with the vitrectum, uh, I repeat, uh, I'm using 23 gauge vitrectum. So the lens, fortunately, was quite, uh, was quite soft. So I can uh, eat only by vitrectum. So little by little, I can remove uh, all the lens material. That's it. So now I'm doing indentation just to check the retina. And I'm, I want to do complete vitrectomy with the peripheral shaving. So we know that it's very important in trauma cases to remove, to remove all the vitreous, even in the extreme periphery. You see some blood clots, of course, but uh, the good, uh, the good uh, point was that the retina was flat. So the patient was quite lucky because he didn't have retinal detachment. So I'm just completing the peripheral shaving, 360 degrees. And now when I finish the peripheral shaving and extreme peripheral uh, uh, vitrectomy, I'm just um, proceed with the uh, end laser. In, in these cases, of course, uh, I always uh, do 360 laser, prophylactic, of course, but also you never know. In trauma, you never know. Maybe you can have a small hole, you can have a small, uh, a retinal hole in the periphery, so always 360 degrees of laser. And now the final graft to, to complete the penetrating keratoplasty. So the, the situation, the final result was good. The retina flat, corner graft is positioned. And uh, of course the patient now is aphakic. So the patient is aphakic and aneuridic. So complete aniridia and aphakia. This is the final result of the surgery. But after four months, after four months, we went back to operating room to implant the artificial iris prosthesis by wrapper. This is the, the most recent artificial iris prosthesis. Wrapper is a Russian company. And the prosthesis is very good because the IOL, the IOL is included in the artificial iris prosthesis. So I'm preparing for, for the scleral, uh, scleral fixation, three points, uh, 12 o'clock, four o'clock, eight o'clock. And you can see the artificial iris with the IOL included in the center. 
I'm using Prolin 10.0. And now I'm just uh, reopening the corneal suture because uh, uh, I did this surgery only four, four months later from the previous uh, penetrating keratoplasty. So the corneal suture was still uh, fresh and the, the, the corneal scar was, was fresh. So it was very easy. It was very easy to reopen the, the corneal wound of the, of the graft. And now I'm implanting uh, the artificial iris with scleral fixation. It's very important uh, to find the good uh, positioning. And now I am just putting again the corneal suture in the same place on the same line of the previous corneal graft. And I'm just closing now the scleral fixation. Uh, you see, you can see it's very important to obtain a good centration of the pupil. And that's it. This, uh, pro this prosthesis is very nice because you can order the, the good color, the color of the patient and the good IOL power using a standard IOL calculation with the uh, YOL master. And now I'm just closing the conjunctiva, and this is the final result of the of the third surgery. So now the patient is uh, with uh, with IOL and with the iris again. And uh, 12 months later, one year later, this is the situation. So the corneal graft is still good, transparent. Uh, IOL uh, uh, is centered. Uh, iris is centered, and patient is happy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matteo, for very nice presentations. And uh, uh, to see or not to see, this is the value of the first stop in our journey, which is the cornea. That may be affected in severely traumatized. <laughs> Uh, and its management is essential in treating what is behind. So, uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, can you show us the challenge in the treatment in such situation with cloudy cornea and posterior segment problem, please? Mm. Can I get, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Megid, for the opportunity. And um, I'm really happy to join this group of uh, distinguished vitreoretinal surgery surgeons, uh, highly specialized in doing trauma cases. This is an 18 year old male um, who uh, presented with um, severe corneoscleral injury with a cutter. The injury did not involve the eye only, but also it involved the lids and um, uh, part of his uh, lips. Uh, primary repair was done by doing vitrectomy and silicon oil injection. And at that time, the clarity of the cornea uh, uh, could allow doing the surgery even from a small uh, part um, of clear cornea. The patient developed total retinal detachment recurrent, uh, vitreoretinal incarceration, and extensive subretinal proliferation. And um, the, in this, I really operate on this patient maybe three times. And uh, in the last operation, this was the picture. The cornea was um, uh, uh, opaque in the, in the most part, uh, severely vascularized, superficial and deep, and stromal vascularization and um, the vision was hand motion. Uh, this is the picture at the time of uh, surgery. So you can see that the cornea is uh, thickened, edematous, uh, opaque, and um, the corneoscleral wound really involves, it's as if it is transversing um, the globe. And, and this is a retrocorneal membrane, and then the same type of um, uh, temporary cratoprothesis, um, as uh, Matteo uh, was using, if retinal membranes were removed, there was a severe PVR 
uh, retinal shortening and extensive subretinal uh, proliferation. Uh, the epiretinal membranes were removed, and um, then I have to remove the subretinal proliferation, which um, were extensive. So uh, retinotomy was performed. And uh, I know that doing retinotomy in these cases um, maybe increase the chance for reproliferation, but this was the uh, only way for repairing this retina using uh, the bimanual technique with uh, two forceps, one hand over hand technique, uh, pushing the retina, trying to get the subretinal uh, proliferation out. And you will see now how uh, huge was the subretinal proliferation. And this may be related to. Um, cutting in the dangerous zone of the uh, ciliary body. The injury was involving uh, this area. There was some retinal rotation that was corrected. There was escape of some PFCL under the retina that was removed. And then the retina was attached uh, with PFCL. Endolaser was injected. Then I, I thought of re-suturing the graft of the patient because silicon oil was inside the eye. And uh, I would not uh, um, uh, risking a graft, uh, putting a clear graft in this uh, patient. And um, later on, the patient uh, underwent another surgery uh, for the removal of epiretinal proliferation um, and uh, implanting a clear graft. The problem in these uh, cases is um, that. It is not only a problem of the retina, but it is also a problem of the cornea. So even if you solve the problem of the retina, which is also difficult, um, the problem of the cornea um, is another big problem because these eyes are prone to develop um, uh, clouding of the, of the graft. So the patient should be prepared that he may need uh, more than uh, surgery, maybe three, four surgeries until the uh, stabilization of the, uh, of, the, of the proliferative process and uh, treatment of the, uh, of the corneal uh, pathology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, the cloudiness in previously traumatizing eye add more challenges in treating retinal detachment. So Dr. Matteo will show us the tips and tricks in retinal detachment surgery through previously traumatic cloudy corn. Dr. Matteo? Yeah. So this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I called it cloudy with the chance of retinal detachment, like cloudy with the chance of meatballs. This is the, 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 my, the my, my child, my, Daughter Ginevra favorite cartoon, so I know it very well. So what to do when cornea is cloudy, when cornea is very uh, opaque with the corneal scar. So in this case, for example, I want to show you, um, I want to show you this situation because sometimes we can have a big corneal scar, uh, but uh, uh, we can uh, avoid the corneal transplantation so we can do the vitrectomy without removing the cornea, so without using temporary keratoprosthesis. And of course, for the patient, of course, it's better to avoid the penetrating keratoplasty. So this is a, an example when uh, we have, of course, we have a big corneal wound, we have a big corneal scar, but uh, we can avoid the penetrating keratoplasty. So uh, in this case, uh, we also have iris laceration, Aphakia, retinal detachment, and traumatic full thickness macula hole stage four. So I just positioned the three trockers, 23 gauge trockers, and I just positioned the chandelier 27 gauge. So let's see. We go inside, and uh, I'm using biome. Biome is a very useful uh, instrumentation to see wide, uh, wide angle viewing system. And now I'm injecting transilolone. I can see the vitreous very well. And uh, you can see a posterior vitreous detachment. This is a young uh, patient. He was uh, uh, 30 years old. So 
no, no, it was um, less, uh, 20, 25 years old, so even younger. And you can see the posterior vitreous detachment is very clear, very, uh, very, very nice to see it with transinolone. So after posterior vitreous detachment induction, I'm injecting PFCL, but you can see now there's a problem because uh, uh, a corneal stitch uh, ruptured. So I have to stop and I have to go back to, I have to go to anterior segment to, to do again some corneal suture because the corneal uh, uh, stitch is uh, broke. So after a new corneal suture, I go back to posterior chamber, to the vitreous chamber, and uh, I have uh, PFCL on the posterior pole. Now I'm doing a um, peripheral retinotomy because uh, uh, as I told you, I, have, uh, I had a retinal detachment with macula hole, but we have, I had no retinal tear in the periphery. So I just did the one peripheric retinotomy just to do the drainage of the subretinal fluid. So now uh, with this uh, retinotomy, I, I, I did the uh, complete drainage of subretinal fluid. Now retina is flat. I found, uh, I found a small uh, intraocular foreign body. This uh, intraocular foreign body was uh, in the periphery of the retina. So I just removed it. Probably it was a piece of glasses. And now I'm uh, completing with endolaser. And now I'm doing the um, iridoplasty to, to create a better uh, iris shape. You see there is uh, this iris uh, rupture and I'm preparing for the IOL. I'm using uh, iris claw IOL, so iris fixation on the posterior surface of the iris. So this, uh, this is posterior enclavation of the iris claw on the posterior surface of the iris. So this is a retropupillary iris claw enclavation. After opening the cornea at 5.5 millimeters. And then of course I'm closing the corneal wound. Usually with uh, three corneal stitches is enough. And now, now I'm going back to posterior, uh, to the vitro chamber to do the gas exchange. I use a C3F8, uh, uh, gas, not pure gas, I'm using uh, the 15%. And now uh, I'm, I'm doing the, the fluid, the, the perfluoro P PFCL gas uh, exchange. And this is the final result. So you see that uh, I did all the procedure, even if the cornea was damaged. Two months later, and also I put, uh, I put the, at the end, I put Densiron. I put Densiron at the end, sorry, sorry, uh, no, no guess. I was, sorry. And then now, two months later, I removed the, the Densiron. I just removed the Densiron. And now, sorry, and now I just put the final uh, gas. And now, I just, now I just, now I put the silicon, uh, 5,000 centistock because actually I, I was um, uh, thinking to uh, tamponate with gas, but I prefer to leave uh, the 5,000 centistock silicon oil because uh, in these cases, I always have fear of a redetachment. And so actually this is a question that I may, that I asked to you, how do you behave with the uh, traumatic retinal detachment? In my experience, sometimes I, I did the, with the gas uh, tamponade and uh, everything was good for one month, but maybe after uh, one month or two months, the retina redetached in traumatic retinal detachment. So now in my experience, I prefer to tamponade with the silicon oil. Uh, anyway, I just show you the, the follow-up, six months follow-up. You see the IOP is good. The, the visual acuity is 0 0.3. After and then after 18 months, visual acuity also is 0 0.3 and intraocular pressure is 15 is good, but the cornea is still good. Cornea is still uh, okay. You see the big corneal scar, big corneal scar, but uh, the cornea is still transparent. This is a CT, so macular hole is closed, and you see the the macula now 
is, is okay. So macular hole is completely closed. And this is the fundus with the silicon oil inside. This is endothelium. And this is the anterior OCT showing the corneal scar again. So uh, this is now the patient uh, destra, after sinistra, 18 months alto, follow up. Basso, you see, the cornea is still transparent. So this is my, my take home message is uh, that uh, using chandelier, using bimanual maneuvers, using glucose gel, glucose gel can help you during the, the surgery to get a better visualization on the cornea, of course. And uh, biome uh, is very, is, is perfect in these cases to obtain a big uh, wide angle viewing system. So thanks to the use of chandelier lights and wide angle viewing system, you can manage cases through a cloudy cornea with poor fundus visualization. Thank you again. Okay, let's uh, now move to the second stop of our journey, which is, which is the iris and the its gate. Of course, this is the pupil. As you all know, market photophobia and blurring of vision may occur <laughs> from an iridia or even traumatic medriasis. And the management of this And, and management of these two difficult situations are also challenged. So Dr. Ashraf Armeya, tell us how to manage this traumatic medriasis of the pupil. Uh, thank you, Megat, for the invitation and uh, to be among all uh, uh, these eminent anterior and posterior segment uh, surgeon. <clears throat> So I have no financial disclosure uh, regarding my presentation. In this case, it's a female patient, 58 years old, uh, done FACO elsewhere since uh, 10 months with dilated fixed pupil, uh, was before the operation, but the surgeon didn't do anything due to the older trauma. I, I found that the, her refraction has a refraction error of minus 2.25 uh, sphere and also 1.75 astigmatism. She has un uh, unsatisfied and becoming crazy with exposure to light. Plus, it's a light iris patient. So I told the patient the only solution uh, that we can start dealing with the dilemma by creating a nearly round, nearly round four millimeter uh, pupil. So this is my technique in this traumatic uh, medriasis. Uh, I I uh, I call it two one four. It's two paracentesis to the right and one paracentesis to the left. Uh, injecting a visco a dispersor. Then very important in these long terms that you stretch the iris uh, very well. Uh, don't uh, try to do pupillary without a, a good stretching of the iris because there is a retro uh, inversion of the iris. The iris is rolled in. So when you catch the iris, and take the, uh, the snap in the iris, you take the edge of the iris, not the rolled in uh, iris, the, it's called the retroversion. First, you can, to, first, uh, suture is very important because it is the guide uh, to the center of the pupil because you cannot know where the center of the pupil in these cases. I use the force through pupillary plasty which is an uh, invasion from Amara and Priya, uh, it makes the iris surgery very easy by one knot. So it's called, my technique is 214, it's 221, and 4 is a 4, four through pupil pass. The first uh, knot is very important. Don't take the other side, the, the same side, unless you take the other side, because with the second uh, uh, suture, you are going to see where is the center of the pupil, now, pour through, that you make four through, and with simple knot, you don't do uh, just one knot with the four through, you can close the iris. So now you are creating nearly the, the center of the pupil. You take another one in the, the first side to close any 
uh, still uh, part of the eye is not closed with the same suture. So you take four sutures, two, two in each side, with this simple technique, which is the fourth root you pair plus two. And the other side. So you're changing the patient's uh, refraction also, which we are going to see now. Because you do another optical uh, position that you make, it's like pinhole pupillary plasty. You are changing the optics of the patient also. Instead of the refraction of the patient uh, was not good, the refraction of the patient was going to change without even changing the IOL uh, position. So after I finish this, you wash the uh, visco, uh, this person. And this is the patient uh, post op the vision changes from 220, 280 to 2040. And the patient is uh, satisfied with he, uh, her vision. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ashraf. Uh, Dr. Matteo, you have a different way in management of uh, traumatic medriasis associated, especially if associated with lens subluxation. Uh, may I ask you to, uh, uh, to show us your technique in management of this traumatic medriasis with lens subluxation? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is uh, the case of this uh, subluxated cataract and xenoloid dialysis and big midriasis. But this is a special case because uh, the midriasis was very old. This trauma uh, was uh, of 30 years before when uh, this guy was a kid of uh, 10 years old. So uh, after all this time, uh, the iris became uh, rigid, unelastic, and it was uh, very hard to obtain a good uh, iridoplasty. It was impossible. So um, I just uh, want to show you how I managed to, um, to try to... Um, to I think uh, did not share the screen. Yeah, no, because uh, I I was just uh, prepared this. Um... Uh, okay. Because, okay, I just prepared the um, the one with the with the. No, I can, okay. I just want to show you this one because uh, it was uh, uh, difficult, it was almost impossible to find, to, to obtain iridoplasty. This one, this is it. Okay, so um, usually the iris is elastic, but now I'm trying to do the, the fecal to remove the, the capsule so I'm doing uh, the, a, a normal uh, capsular axis. I, I'm please, trying in just an appearance. screen, Dr. Matteo, please share the screen. The screen? Yes, we... Ah, okay, we, okay, sorry. We couldn't see you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. Now... Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry, sorry. Now you can see? Yes. Okay, so I'm doing... Uh, and uh, I'm trying to do a FECO because this uh, is an extremely subluxated cataract, traumatic. So I'm doing uh, a capsular axis after triple and blue staining, of course. And this is uh, quite difficult, but uh, using uh, forceps and scissors, I try to obtain quite 
quite regular, quite regular capsular axis. Now I'm completing the capsular axis. And now I'm doing hydro dissection. So the, the lens is very soft. Lens is very soft, very easy to remove, of course. This patient is young. But now I'm, I can see that the capsular bag is very, very stable shaped. The zonal dialysis is too big. And uh, even if I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing my capsular takeoff, but uh, it's almost uh, it's difficult to, to keep the bag. And actually, I didn't have a Sioni ring. Maybe in this case, the Sioni ring was the, the, the good solution, but I didn't have Sioni ring. And so I just prefer to, to remove. Uh, this is finished. The, 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 the cortical um, remnants are removed. The cortex is removed. I prefer at the end to remove the capsular bag because it was very subluxated and I cannot, uh, I cannot use this capsular bag. So I just prefer to remove completely the capsular bag to obtain a, a complete aphakia now without capsular bag remnants. I'm doing a anterior, anterior vitrectomy. I'm doing anterior, I'm doing anterior vitrectomy. And uh, I also injected. Now this is an uh, anterior chamber maintainer. plastic but in this case was impossible because uh, the iris tissue was fibrotic was very rigid was completely unelastic so as you can see i tried again again but uh, it, it didn't work also i was also i, I was doing uh, damage so in this case uh, i just uh, uh, it's impossible so i just do the last attempt using, uh, The normal uh, sipser sliding knot technique, proline to zero suture. And now I'm pulling the suture, but uh, you see the, the iris tissue is not elastic at all. So you see the iris is broke, is breaking. The iris is breaking. So I, I just realized that uh, it was not possible to suture. This is just an attempt. It's just uh, trying to do, you know, it's impossible. So I'm I'm creating I'm creating a, an anhydro dialysis. So I just stopped. It was not possible to proceed, and so I just said, okay, not possible to do iridoplasty because the iris is too rigid. The trauma was too old. It was uh, 30 years before. Intanto facciamo una carrellata sulle nuove sale. Allora, Matteo Forlini. So I just did the, the second surgery and this was the artificial iris implantation. Uh, actually, I did that in a live surgery in December in Italy. There was the... the, the, the world, An iridio o qualcosa di simile? National, uh, National Congress. And uh, this is the... Um, Uh, the artificial iris implantation. So I ordered uh, again uh, a wrapper, prosthesis. Because this was uh, during live surgery, so uh, there are other surgeons operating at that time. Oh, sorry. I just want to go on because uh, time uh, is finishing. Okay, so I'm doing the scleral flaps, you see. 
I'm just going fast. Anterior chamber maintainer. And again, this is the artificial iris. Uh, this was uh, the, the previous case, you see. So this was the, the images that I showed you. And now this is the solution. Artificial iris with scleral fixation. Again, uh, as I showed you before, this is uh, ten zero proline and uh, using uh, the scleral fixation, this is the position. So uh, in this case, when the iris is very rigid and the midriasis is very old, very uh, fixed. So the midriasis usually is good for iridoplasty with pupilloplastic technique like uh, sipser sliding knot technique. But when you have a very old trauma with artificial iris, uh, uh, with, with the iris very rigid and uh, fibrotic, the only solution is artificial iris, like in this case. So this is the end of the case, and uh, you see now I'm just doing, I'm just completing the centering of the artificial iris prosthesis again. And in these cases, I always use uh, the um, uh, anterior chamber maintainer because, uh, okay, another option is to use the viscoelastic, but uh, you, you should use a lot of viscoelastic because the viscoelastic always uh, goes out from the anterior chamber and you don't have the control of, of the intraocular pressure. So I, I prefer using anterior chamber maintainer always in these cases of uh, big trauma surgeries. So this is the last uh, suture and um, this is it. I know that other colleagues prefer uh, to use the viscoelastic, but another uh, reason to use anterior chamber maintainer is to contrast the hemorrhage, because if you have some hemorrhages, the anterior chamber maintainer can stop the hemorrhages. But if you're using viscoelastic and if you have hemorrhage, viscoelastic is not so good if you have hemorrhages. So I, I prefer uh, always anterior chamber maintainer in this kind of uh, complex surgeries. And this is the final result. So five months later, this is the result. The corneal is, tra the cornea is transparent and the artificial iris is well centered. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, management of traumatic aniridia is not that easy as it is a challenging procedure, especially in aphic eyes to implant huge optic with iris pattern. So, uh, Dr. Sanjit, can we show us how to manage uh, this case of uh, aniridia, please? Thank you, Dr. Majid, for giving me this opportunity. So I'll just present my technique of managing aniridia. Uh, I use an NIRIDIA IOL and I, my preferred technique is the hang back technique. So I'll be showing one case of uh, this technique. This is a 53 years female who had a post traumatic NIRIDIA and she had undergone vitrectomy for a vitreous hemorrhage plus RD earlier. And uh, now she uh, was now being treated for NIRIDIA. So this is my technique. I think the audio is embedded in the So first we sorry. Dr. Sanjit, uh, the, voice, the, vo the voice of your uh, videos overlap your voice. Okay. I think uh, I mute the video. Yes, please. Yes, you can, you can explain now. Right. Is it muted now? Yes. Okay. 
I make a. I think there is some. We couldn't hear you, Sanjit. So now uh, I make this lottery. I, I put this cadulas and after this lottery is made, I take this NIDA IOL, which is available in India, and to these loops of this uh, haptic loop, I pass the 10 0 proline suture, and then I bring this suture out from this inferior sclerotomy on one side. And the other other end of the suture is brought to the superior sclerotomy on the uh, the same side, and this procedure is repeated on the contralateral side. So once when these these all these four ends are out, I insert the IOL inside, and then remove these cannulas, leaving the sutures behind. Then the IOL is centered and these sutures are tied by giving a three to one knot. And this knot is then buried inside these sclerotomies. And both the sclerotomies are, both the knots on the other, both the sides have to be moved in different directions to center the IOL. After this, the incision is sutured and the conjunctiva is sutured. And this is one month post-op, the best corrected vision was six by six in this time. So this is how I will, I'm usually manage a patient of traumatic NIDDR. Okay, thank you, Sanjit. And really also is a big problem if associated with traumatic retinal The voice is not coming, Dr. Margie. Okay. Uh, and really also is a big problem if associated with traumatic retinal detachment in affected eyes due to lack of compartments of the globe. There is no barrier between anterior segment and, anterior, and posterior segment as well making a thrombinating agent like silicon oil in contact with the back surface of the cornea, with resultant possible decompensation and intractable glaucoma may be the results. So let us see you this uh, interesting case. This is a case of traumatic retinal detachment in congenital anaridia. Cataract extraction was performed 17 years before, and the patient has Salisman nodular regenerations in the mid periphery of the cornea, make the visibility to some extent hard to do vitrectomy. I did vitrectomy surgery routinely, as, I, as, as if I did in uh, uh, rheumatogenous retinal detachments, peeling of the posterior hyoid, shaving of the vitreous base. And now I decided to do a barrier between the anterior segment and the posterior segment using a mesh work or a mesh from the Berlin 10 0, using two arms of proline perpendicular to each other, making a mesh, and the bore of the mesh prevent the migration of any silicon oil to the anterior segment because the buoyancy of the silicon oil prevent its migration from this pore. And then I went back to the posterior segments to complete my vitrectomy surgery doing drainage retinotomy because I couldn't find the tear in this peripheral opaque cornea. We can see nicely the reflex of the mesh against the air and finally the silicon oil was injected, leaving a small bubble in the anterior segment. This is the most operative uh, picture after a few days from the primary surgery. And after three months, I decided to remove the silicon oil as well as I removed the uh, mesh of the, the, the threads of the uh, proline. And I removed the, uh, the mesh. And at the same time, our consultants in our hospital, Professor Fatih Fauzi, decided to do the IRIS IOL, which is Morsher IOL. But this technique is different from uh, uh, our colleague Sanjit because he did. Uh, 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 scleral uh, tunnel, uh, not scleral tunnel, a uh, uh, Hoffman pockets, and uh, then implant this iris, uh, the aniridia uh, IOL. And this is the final picture. The vision in this case improved to 0.16 from hand motions during detachment, during in case of traumatic detachment. <coughs> So uh, the next stop in our journey is the lens, whether crystalline lens or IOL. Let us see how lens subluxation, whether crystalline lens or IOL, 
as this may need a lot of a challenge to preventing it from invading the posterior segment and cause any damage. Let us see this challenge with Dr. Ashraf Armia in his case of zonal radiations after ocular trauma. Please, Ashraf. Uh, this case uh, came to me for a cataract uh, surgery. She was a female patient, 65 years old. Uh, history of drop of vision was gradually after trauma since five years. But on examination, uh, I saw a weird shape of dense uh, posterior subcatheter cataract in one side of the uh, lens. The other side was not too much uh, cataractus. With the radial shape, a uh, cortical cataract was seen. Uh, this is the picture. So there is a posterior subcapsular cataract. There is a weird uh, uh, cataract in this side. And there is a track like this. So before I start the operation, I was planning. And uh, on the sit lamp, I didn't see any subluxation. But uh, my decision uh, uh, during the surgery to plan everything possible uh, tool with me uh, for any problem can happen. So, as I started the operation, I did uh, visco uh, cohesive. Then, very important, see, as you see this, uh, uh, this sign, very important to watch. When this happened, this wrinkling, this is the first sign you should notice in any traumatic cataract. That means that this side is not the zinules are not okay and the other side is okay. So I continued the rexus. It was not a problem for me. It was okay. Then, as I am doing the rotation of the lens, another problem, another sign appear. This, that I feel that the zinules is starting to be more, uh, more clear to me. So at this position, you should stop and think what to do to complete your cataract traumatic case safely. So I took the decision to use the capsular hooks and I put it at the two sides of the two zonulosus parts. So I take the fluid of the FECO in between and these are supporting the two points. So I continue the FECO because it was a great uh, three uh, cataract, it was not a uh, soft cataract. When I, sh when I divide, I divide against the part of the zinolus. It's very important. And you are going to see how the rexus and the bag is stable by using these capsular uh, hooks. Uh, they are making the operation safe for me and making a chance for me to, impl to implant safely inside the bag. After you finish your FACO cataract as usual, very important, very important, don't remove your capsular hooks in this position. Uh, and this is the modified capsular hooks from MST. This is the last version, very small, does not interfere. Very important before you remove your FACO in these cases to maintain your intraocular pressure with a visco dispersive uh, uh, OVD. Don't go out and leave the IOP lost. Very important not to increase the neurosis. At this side, you should put your CTR. Don't remove these uh, capsules before you, you put your CTR. And I use the modified CTR in case I, I, I felt in the bag it was not okay. I'm going to suture. But this is I didn't uh, uh, need this because the bag was stable. I implanted and then uh, did the FACO and safely from traumatic uh, zonulosis, I, ca I could save the bag because I noticed the problem early. So uh, always I say two signs very important in traumatic cases early to watch and no to notice it is safely that you save your bag for a good implantation inside the bag. Okay, if subluxation is massive and associated with undilatable pupil, it will add more challenge to overcome these difficulties and avoid any damage 
to anterior and posterior segment as well. So Dr. Bassem, uh, uh, let us see how to overcome these uh, difficulties. Okay, thank you Dr. Maggot for your kind invitation and thank you Ibu Farmo. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, this is a case of 68 years old male who had the blunt trauma uh, by mm -hmm. two weeks ago. Uh, on examination, the visual acuity was hand motion with good projection. The iris was tremulous. A regular depth of the anterior chamber. Uh, because of his age, the pupil was not dilatable. And it's grade four or five uh, brown nuclear cataract. And the B scan was non uh, remarkable. So I plan to do FACO and to use the Sione ring and implant in the sulcus. Now creation of two Hoffman pockets. Then in the, uh, to dilate the pupil, I used the Medugan ring uh, insertion. It was a little bit difficult because of the iridodenesis and I have no support with the iris, uh, sorry, with the lens, but I succeeded to uh, put it and I achieved a good dilatation of the pupil. Then, in these cases, I prefer to start the rexes by 27 gauge insulin needle. You can see the, the corrugation in the anterior lens capsule, as Dr. Ashraf told us. Then, after completing about half of the capsule rexes, you can see that the lens is moving in all directions. I decided to use the first capsule hook just to help me and act, uh, act as the second, uh, third hand to complete the capsule rexes. Now, the rexes is completed. And I will implant, uh, I will use two more capsule hooks. You can use a second instrument to aid you to implant it, uh, to fix it in the back. Now, height of the section, and you can see how hard is the uh, cataract here. The bag is stable because of the capsule hooks. Now you can do, I prefer to do stop and chop technique, FACO. Uh, everything is crowded in the anterior chamber because of the pupil. Now more rotation of the lens to get it by chopping technique. Uh, the bag capsule is redundant. The lens is uh, very huge, as you can see here. Uh, but thank you to the capsule hooks who helped me to uh, complete the case. Then I put more and more methyl to pro just to protect the endothelium and to have good depth of the anterior uh, chamber. Uh, then completing the rest of the uh, nucleus and preparing the bag for implantation, then irrigation, aspiration of the cortical matter. But sometimes things don't go the way you expect. Oh my God, there is a tear in the posterior capsule. So I removed the hooks. Then you can see here the large capsular tear in the posterior capsule, then removal of these instruments then tamponading the vitreous by this coat, and then doing anterior vitrectomy and removal of this residual uh, lens matter from the anterior chamber. More and more anterior vitrectomy and removal of the whole capsular bag. Then by the aid of trimesulone to make sure that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And now, my plan was change it to implant a uh, retropupillary uh, very size, as Dr. Fulini sh showed us. Easy, you can implant it. It's very easy and uh, very stable. And finally, I closed the wound by then nylon suture, and this was the final picture of the case. Okay, fibrotic anterior capsule is a late traumatic cataract development. Uh, add more difficulties and uh, challenge as well. So, Dr. Ashraf, can you show us your case in this difficult situation? Uh, yes, Megan. Uh, this was a case of a child, 15 years old. Uh, he has a history of right eye blunt trauma since five years. And he developed severe ocular inflammation following the trauma, ending by formation of white patchy membranes on the iris and the anterior surface of the lens with two areas of peripheral anterior synechia. 
complicated wide cataract also developed. The vision was hand motion, good projection, good macular function. The intraocular pressure was 16 millimeter murky and the retina was in place by ultrasound. <clears throat> so, this was the case. This is the picture. This is a white membranes and membranes over the lens. And only this part is clearly seen. So my, my, my opinion in these cases, or my plan, it was uh, to find uh, where is I'm going to remove the membrane because I know that this membrane in this side, it cannot be removed because it's totally amalgamated with the iris. Any intervention for this, we are going to lose the iris tissue. So with the viscodispersive and viscocohesive, uh, high visco to protect the cornea in these cases because, uh, because of the inflammation happened, the endothelium is not, definitely is not good. I'm trying to see where, where I am going to stop. With the micro scissor, I'm trying to find a plane between this membrane and the anterior surface of the lens without, without opening the anterior capsule, which is a very mandatory. I need to end the case in a very nice way. So slowly with the micro scissors from both sides, uh, taking the uh, edge of the, uh, of the old iris, removing the membranes here, then I'm doing a staining of the capsule. In this stage, I used the malignant ring, which is out of label to use in these fibrotic uh, 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 parts. It was not an easy to implant the, the, really the uh, malignant ring. It was okay here, here, but this side, it was very difficult. It took a lot of time because the thickness it was thickened. Very important in these cases to do a proper good size uh, rexus because uh, if this is a child and uh, the eye is inflamed, not to have another uh, adhesion between the, uh, in, the inflammatory in the, iris in the, and the, uh, capsule. And the uh, capsule. So I remove the, so uh, the, the cataract. Uh, the cataract. Then I'm planting a single piece, removing the uh, malugan ring. But I did here also after a, some snips to decrease the inflammation postoperatively, not to close up it. So the eye changed it from hand motion to 2080 uh, postoperatively. And uh, this is how I did the case. Thank you, Ashraf. Dr. Sanjit has a video of subluxated one piece lens and will show us how small incision can be made to remove this IOL. Dr. Sanjit? Thank you, Dr. Majid. I, I, I just shared this case. This was a post traumatic IOL subluxation. The patient also had a vitreous hemorrhage, uh, and we did the vitectomy also in the same sitting, but I'll just focus on the I just focus on the uh, removal of the lens in this patient. So this was the patient. Uh, he had a post-traumatic IOL subluxation. So we went ahead with a team to 3.5 millimeters of chloroquinol tunnel incision. And then the lens was separated from the vitreous. The lens was hooked by, from the haptic by one of the hooks and uh, the cutter was used to separate the lens. The incision was then opened, a good coating was done. One haptic was prolapsed out of this small incision. The inner part of this haptic was cut because I wanted to have a good hold. Now I'm using this McPherson forceps and holding the IOL from the edge. Now take a spatula or a hook above the lens and then just bending the forceps anti-clockwise. You just bend it anti-clockwise and the IOL folds itself. And once it is around 180 degrees folded, then you can just pull this lens out from this 3 to 3.5 millimeter incision. So just wanted, just did it recently and wanted to share this case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjit. Management of uh, 
traumatic subluxation of retrobabelia precise is not that easy also in all cases. And I will show two cases of different managements. This is a case of traumatic subluxation of one side of retrobabelia precise. This case I did for him uh, vitrectomy uh, uh, two years before and silicon oil injection and I inject the, uh, I uh, implant the retrobabelia precise during silicon oil removal. And after trauma, as we see, I support the, the side of attached precise by a, a light pipe and on the opposite side through the sideboard I do incubations just a few minutes. I finalize my job and close the eye and uh, the, the operation is finished. But in not all cases, it looks like these cases and not all cases are simply easy. This is other case of the same scenario uh, as well. Trauma, drawing visions, past history of vitrectomy. I did two years more or more before traumatic uh, subluxation of one side. I tried to do the same technique and, away, and they tried to do incubation away from the uh, area of previous incubations, but the IOL is, is, is floating because the two lines of incubation are not, are not on the same line. So the, uh, the Versailles uh, are mobile and all of a sudden uh, it, it, it falls down back to rest on the uh, posterior segment. So I catch and grasp the Versailles, deliver it in the anterior segments, and uh, I, uh, I uh, do a scleral uh, uh, tunnel. I usually do, and I do like the incisions uh, of a scleral tunnel. I do for round incision and deal with this IOL as if it is I implanted for the first time, put the two haptics behind the IOL, obliquely, not horizontal like previous, and do incubations like a oblique inclination away from the previous inclination site. And finally, I close the uh, wound by just uh, one suture of uh, vacril uh, 80. So, uh, Dr. Bassem, in case of recurrent centered three-piece three IOL after being reposited after following trauma in primary surgery, do you remove it, replace it, or doing another trial of fixation? <coughs> okay, this is a 58 years old female uh, who had the centered uh, sulcus three-piece uh, IOL after blunt trauma two months ago. Uh, first recentration with optic capture, uh, I did six weeks after the trauma, but unfortunately, two weeks later, the IOL was uh, decentered again. So, uh, in, in this video, you can uh, notice the decentration of the IOL uh, and the size of the pupil is mid dilated. Now, delivering the, just the optic in the anterior chamber to make uh, pupillary capture, and then I decided to fixate the same IOL uh, with the aid of 9-0 uh, proline suture by, uh, as Dr. Ashraf said to us, the by single pass four through technique uh, to fixate the, uh, this lens again to avoid many uh, or uh, future recentration again. The same uh, was done with the superior and inferior uh, haptics. Um, this is a uh, four path. You have to do it four. You will enter in this loop uh, four times. First one, then the second one. Uh, because of the viscoelastic, it was a little bit hard to catch the proline. Uh, then after four uh, passes through this loop, this is another way to do the single pass four through technique. And then pulling on the two ends of this proline and you will have a good knot and the very, it's enough to fixate the pupil. But unfortunately, uh, after 
repositioning the, uh, uh, this IOL below the iris in, in the sulcus, I got a pupillary ovalization, maybe due to dilatation or due to the near place of the suture near the pupillary edge. So I decided to do a uh, simple uh, pupilloplasty and to do uh, sphincterotomy just to avoid any deformation of the pupil and to overcome this ovalization. And this was the final picture at the end of the uh, surgery. So I prefer to uh, use the same lens uh, other in, than to remove and re-implant another one as long as I can do this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Basim. Uh, Suturally scale fixation of 3 bis IOL also is a valid option for subluxation of 3 bis IOL or in correction of FEK in general. So Dr. Ashraf Shaharawi, tell us about your experience in Yemeni technique in trauma case. Dr. Ashraf? <coughs> Uh, I will show you my case. Um, actually, this is a six-year-old male patient with history of severe plant trauma with a horn of an ox. The visual acti was hand motion, uh, and in the other eye, it was free. The anterior segment, uh, there was a tremulous iris Aphecia and dense vitreous uh, uh, hemorrhage. <coughs> and actually, this was uh, uh, the ultrasound of the patient showing dense vitreous opacity with the lens lying on the surface of the retina. The patient went for vitreous, um, sorry, went for uh, vitreous uh, surgery uh, doing a three uh, port uh, vitrectomy. And as you can see, the lens is lying on the surface of the retina. And there was a, a, a giant retinal break on the temporal side after vitrectomy with shaving of the vitreous base and removal of the whole vitreous hemorrhage. A separate incision was uh, done to introduce the phragmatome, removing the lens from the surface of the retina in the vitreous cavity. And you have to do the, the ultrasound away from the surface of the retina. Then, uh, can you excuse me for a minute? So I'll just reshare the screen. Um, now, again, retract me. And as you can see, there is a, a giant retinal break. Um, and the phragmatome is used. And the phragmatome is used to remove the lens from the vitreous cavity away from the retinal surface doing vacuum and then getting the lens into the mid vitreous and using the ultrasound in 60 to 70 percent of the power till complete removal of the lens now since the incisions are closed you have to insert a three piece iol instead of a widening of the incision and inserting of a, a five millimeter lens uh, art, a, a yamani technique was done inserting a band 27 gauge uh, uh, insulin syringe, but the lens dropped for the first time and you have to catch it from the vit mid vitreous and regaining the end of the haptic away to the sclera. Then going to the other side in the horizontal region, doing the same on the other haptic. You have to do it very, very slowly. Otherwise, in a very slow motion. Otherwise, you may get a cut end of the haptic and you get complete drop of the lens inside the vitreous cavity. In a very slow motion, you extract uh, uh, the, the tip of the haptic of the lens and then you apply cautery or heat to form a flange which prevents the end of the three-piece lens to retract inside the vitreous cavity. Now you have to go back 
flatten your retina, apply laser to the giant retinal break, which was present on the temporal side. And as you can see, the lens is very stable and very well centralized in spite of being hanged from the side in Yemen technique fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. The next stop uh, in our journey is heavy traffic with intraocular foreign body. Penetrating trauma with sharp objects usually associated with intraocular foreign body, which may be associated with retina detachment <laughs> and the removal of intraocular foreign body add more challenge to the detachment surgery. So uh, please, Dr. Hassan, let us know how challenge would be, especially if foreign body is large or huge. Thank you, Megan. And um, <clears throat> can you see my screen now? Yes. OK. Um, this is a 70-year-old male with a history of car accident since five years. The patient underwent somewhere else, um, actually in, in another country, um, cataract surgery and IOL implantation since five, four, four years. And uh, he presented with um, uh, marked diminution of vision, unstable RL, undilated pupil, and um, operatively we found uh, an old standing retina detachment uh, with a large uh, glass fragment inside the eye. This was the picture. And um, uh, uh, the first step, I, um, I confronted a problem because this is a large glass fragment. The edges are sharp and the corners are very pointed. Um, and this piece of glass is resting um, over a detached mobile retina. So I think the, the best way um, um, is to inject uh, viscohelium um, underneath the glass fragment and this helps to elevate the glass fragment and push the um, detached retina away and then using a, um, a relatively large foreign body forceps i coat the uh, the glass fragment and uh, i pushed the detached retina which um, was stuck in a way to the glass fragment and then with the other hand, I enlarged the, uh, another sclerotomy. And because I did not want the glass fragment to uh, fall again on the retina. Once the um, glass fragment was safely removed, the uh, visco was removed, and then PFCL is injected to flatten the retina. The internal limiting membrane was removed, more PFCL was injected, and then I noticed the presence of anterior PDR, and there was uh, multiple areas of cryo applications, which the patient did not uh, tell me anything about, and then uh, 36 degrees retinotomy was performed, laser was applied, and finally, uh, PFCL was directly exchanged with uh, silicon oil. The silicon oil was removed the three months. The vision, uh, the retina remained stable and the vision improved from um, hand movement to um, point, uh, point, uh, point one, I think. Okay, this is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, the foreign body may be obvious in the anterior chamber and need special surgical skills to remove it without any collateral damage. So Dr. Ashraf Armeya, show us the safe technique to remove the intraocular foreign body from anterior chamber without any damage. Uh, uh, this is, was uh, so weird uh, for me, uh, patient. This patient uh, was a male, a child, uh, eight years old. Uh, history of penetrating trauma to the right eye by gunshot, or uh, as he said, since two months, repaired uh, re rupture group was done since two months. And he came to me uh, with the pattern of his iris has been changed since the trauma. And uh, 
his relative said to me that, uh, that this is not his color of the iris. The vision was barely hand motion, was a good macular function, and uh, his projection was fair. Intraocular pressure was 17 millimeter mercury, and the cornea was in good state. With a shallow anterior chamber, no pupil uh, could be detected on the slam, uh, under this lamp. I, could, I, I couldn't see the pupil. I did it in my sonar, and the sonar said that there is acoustic evidence of multiple amorphous uh, membranes, and there is an intraocular foreign body, non-metallic, and this is a size. Uh, also evaluated in the plain X-ray, and this is his sonar, and this is the echogenicity of the intraocular foreign body. So I told the patient that I'm going to go, and I don't know where is the foreign body and what I'm going uh, to do. So this is uh, was his picture on the uh, uh, the operation theater. This is the old repaired uh, rupture glue. This is maybe the, the site of entry. And this is another area of trauma. There is a peripheral anterior synechia here. And I can see the pupil. So I started the operation to paracentesis. And with a viscocohesive, I am trying to guess how hard is this foreign body? Where is it? Is it attached or it's a free? So I felt that this is the area where is the foreign body is. Trying with the, in these cases, don't do aggressive uh, trauma to the iris more than this. Always blunt dissection, uh, very important in these cases. With a visco uh, dispersive, I'm trying to uh, dissect the iris or the membranes from this orange, uh, area with more viscoelastic to protect the cornea. I'm trying to remove the membranes and the iris, trying to dislodge this huge intraocular foreign body from the angle with minimal trauma as I can. Injecting more with the Seneski, I'm trying to remove, and finally injecting more visco uh, dispersive. And finally, I got the, this huge intraocular foreign body uh, dislodged safely with, with the minimal trauma to the anterior chamber. This is, was my first step. So now I am removing uh, this huge uh, intraocular foreign body from the anterior chamber. Now I'm trying to deal where is the, uh, there is a cataract, membranous cataract, residual fibrosis, vitreous, vitreous, vitreous. So I'm trying to, to widen more and more the iris tissue. And then at this point, I wanted to use the, uh, the ocutome, trying with the scissor first to cut the, this membrane because I, and now I found that this is a membranous part, it's not the cataract and there is no lens. The lens is just uh, uh, totally uh, absorbed, cutting the prefrontal synechia. With the ocutome, I'm trying to remove it. I found it is very uh, tough to, re to be removed by the uh, ocutome. I'm using the micro scissor to cut this membrane to find the pupil. I'm using the bimanual technique to, find, to cut this membranes from two ports, more bimanual. So making the pupil clear for me. Proper anterior vitrectomy was done and closing the wound. And then after two, one month, this is the picture. This is how it was before. And this is how it is with a vision, with a corrected, with a contact lens corrected uh, up to uh, 660. I'm planning uh, to, to do a second implantation uh, for the, the, the posterior segment was okay. I can see the retina well. And I'm trying uh, to use a second implantation for this child. I am going to use the MNE technique for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashraf. The foreign body may be impacted and hidden whether in the anterior segment or in the posterior segment. Dr. Bessin, you have a case of hidden intraocular foreign body in the anterior chamber. So let us see your case and how did you suspect its presence? 
Okay, this is a case of uh, 32 years old uh, manual worker uh, who uh, received uh, trauma while hammering a nail uh, one, week, one day uh, before. Uh, on examination, there was a small corneal wound uh, and dilated fundus examination showed within normal appearance of the posterior segment. Uh, actually, there was no apparent intraocular foreign body was detected either uh, in the uh, anterior segment nor on the posterior uh, segment. So, uh, sorry. So this is the video. Uh, the idea came to my mind to search for it by the gonio lens. And I succeeded to find them, this metallic foreign body in the angle uh, of the eye, it's the lower part of the angle, so I opened a corneal wound just opposite to its place and injected a dispersive, uh, cohesive, uh, dispersive uh, OVD, and then by the aid of the uh, foreign body forceps and the gonio lens, I removed this foreign body with cautious not to uh, injure the cornea or the lens, uh, below me, but uh, it was entangled in the cornea, but it was removed easily by the aid of dispersive OVD. Then uh, re-examination again of the angle uh, to be sure that there is no any injury to the angle like hemorrhage or very minute irisodiasis, and then closure of this small corneal wound by single suture of 9O nylon suture and uh, uh, wash of the old dispersive OVD from the anterior chamber and closure of the wound and making sure that the wound is well sealed. So thank you, Basim. Uh, I have also a case of hidden foreign body which was neglected for six years, although it wasn't shown by ultrasound in primary surgery, which was traumatic cataract surgery at the time of trauma by one of my colleagues. And after six years, he developed cedrosis with defective vision, although ERG showed mild affection and the new ultrasound suspects intraocular foreign body. Let's see in this case. Now you, saw, you can see me? Yes, this is ultrasound. This is ultrasound in 2013. No obvious intraocular foreign body, just cataract and uh, uh, just opacity in the posterior capsule here. And in 2019, this is a reaction. This is cedrosis. And by CT, the, uh, there is uh, uh, intraocular uh, foreign body was very obvious. That's why uh, I'm asking at first, we should do uh, both uh, CT and ultrasound because this forum, this case wasn't obvious in the ultrasound, but very obvious in the CT after six years. I don't know why. Uh, sorry. I don't know. Uh, can you see me or? Uh, Oh, no, yes. Okay. Yes, we can see you, but you're not sharing your screen. This is the uh, ERG, mild affection of ERG. That's uh, also he had severe cirrhosis and severe reaction in the uh, anterior chamber and the posterior chamber and the posterior segment as well. This is the case. We can see the golden reflex of cirrhosis everywhere, like is uh, like. Uh, but this, I found this. Uh, Rust, but I, I, I didn't convince that it is a foreign body that you are looking for. So during indentation, I, I, I saw that something abnormal here. So I suspected the presence of the intraocular foreign body in that, in that area. I tried to dislodge it. this foreign body. Yes, it's there. I dislodged it and uh, until he falling down that I, at that time, I realized that it was a nail with a, a large uh, head and tail. I inject a viscoelastic to protect the retina against any falling down. I uh, grasped the foreign body from its head and tried to remove it uh, by the second uh, light pipe. I tried to make alignments between the uh, shaft of the, foreign, uh, the instruments and the foreign body but falling down. I uh, think that uh, uh, when I grasped it from its tail, 
but it was a very bad idea because it's falling down as it stuck to the internal sclerotomy and falling down and make an injury to the retina. So I decided at the time to do by manual surgery and then grasp the head of the nail with the uh, foreign body forceps and with another forceps, I uh, hand to hand check to make a fitness of the uh, foreign body and the foreign body forceps and to feeding the foreign body with the concavity of the foreign body uh, forceps and then enlarging the sclerotomy with good grasping and then uh, uh, discharge the, uh, remove the foreign body as we see this big uh, uh, intraocular metallic foreign body after six years of embankments in the global world. And then I continue my protective surgery as usual, do laser and I did silicon oil as usual in traumatic cases, especially in these cases, the neglected foreign body, I usually like to do a silicon oil tambourine. This is, uh, 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 let's move to unexpected situation. As we all see in all ocular trauma, we should expect unexpected events during surgery. If you faced with multiple ocular injuries during surgery after blunt trauma, hyphema, for example, vitreous hemorrhage, sub, uh, supracranial hemorrhage, iris injury, subluxation, and so on. So Dr. Whale, what are your priorities during management of unexpected events and situation? Actually speaking, I uh, usually give the priority to the retina. Yes, can you hear me now? Dr. Ray? Yes. Yes, well, we can hear you. Dr. Ray, do you hear me? Just a moment. Yes, can you see now? Yes, well. Yes, clear. Clear. Okay, very good. Uh, well, uh, I usually give the priority to the retina. Okay, we are ready to um, avoid a lot of steps uh, in a primary procedure in this situation. If we know that there are, we expect to find a lot of injuries inside the eye, uh, we can postpone some steps to a later stage because we all know that not everything can be uh, accomplished in one procedure. In this situation, for example, where there, the patient is a young girl who presented with uh, blunt trauma by an elastic band, a large elastic band that uh, slipped and bumped into her eyes, uh, and she came with hemophthalmos, hyphema, and uh, vitreous hemorrhage and uh, hemorrhagic retinal detachment. Uh, I found this as a vague situation because, okay, I will remove the hemorrhage, but I'm not sure what I'm going to find and what may be the obstacles in my way. I usually start in this case by inserting the choker of the infusion, of the infusion line without adding an infusion line in case I will do a lensectomy or a fake. Here, the first situation after removing the clotted hyphema was that I found out there is uh, iridodialysis. And I had to make sure there is no vitreous in this area. So I had to hold the uh, dialyzed uh, iris apart until I try attempt to do a capsular excess. When I attempted to perform the capsular excess, I found out that this is a subluxated lens. I had to take a decision. So would I focus more on the lens surgery now or just to do a lensectomy and to focus and my attention to the posterior segment? where I may expect to find a lot of things, not only a vitreous hemorrhage. So I performed a lensectomy and I removed the capsule completely and I entered to the vitreous cavity to remove the vitreous hemorrhage and to inspect the posterior segment uh, underneath that hemorrhage. Uh, of course, the advantage here was that it was just one week after the blunt trauma the hemorrhage uh, looked fresh somehow, partly clotted. Uh, this helps me especially in managing the peripheral vitreous hemorrhage at the aura serrata, uh, which when fresh is easy to manage. Here I could also detach the posterior hyaloid, the bloody posterior hyaloid. Uh, to, and of course, the mainstay here in the management of this situation is to uh, closely monitor the periphery detect any areas of uh, breaks or residual uh, vitreous hemorrhage. It is very, it is essential to uh, 
dissect the vitreous space carefully in these eyes and any suspicious area of a laceration or uh, even abnormal tissue uh, around the hemorrhage, I prefer to lace these areas, suspicious areas, and uh, to go for a 360 uh, laser application uh, along the uh, aura serrata, the vitreous space. Um, and there is another point also in this case, um, you see that there is a severe commotion retina and extensive subretinal hemorrhage in the retina. I prefer in, in this case to give the priority to two points, to make sure that the hemorrhage wouldn't uh, recur again. And so I uh, injected silicon oil as a tamponade. And of course, at this point, I postponed the idea of having a primary uh, intraocular lens implantation in that procedure. I have to make sure first there is no recurrent hemorrhage uh, and that the retina will stay uh, stable and no development of retina detachment of or a peripheral proliferation and then come back to a second stage of um, anterior segment uh, evaluation. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wael. Uh, uh, rupture of anterior capsule or both anterior capsule and the posterior capsule in traumatic cataract is a common finding in blunt trauma. But when we find rupture of posterior capsule with intact anterior capsule, it is unusual in cases of blunt trauma. So Dr. Besson, show us your challenge in uh, intraoperative unexpected situation. Okay, this is a case of uh, 35 years old uh, Down syndrome male. Uh, presented with marked drop of vision in his left eye. Uh, by history taking, uh, it was revealed that he had a blunt trauma uh, to his face two years ago during an epileptic fit. On examination, the lens was white, fibrotic, and absorbent, and the B scan showed non remarkable uh, findings. And uh, I started uh, the surgery usually by doing uh, staining of the anterior lens capsule by Treban Blue. I found it intact and take the complete staining. And I started the rexes. I prefer to start it by, in these cases, by MVR or any uh, sharp instrument. Then the rexes was easy and ended in uh, rounded rexes, as you can see. But surprisingly, as you can see, the vitreous was prolapsing in the anterior chamber through a posterior capsule defect. So I injected a viscose to tamponade the vitreous, then by the coaxial cutter of the uh, signature machine, uh, I did the anterior vitrectomy and uh, aspiration of the residual lens matter. Now you can see how is the tear uh, on the left side and then uh, implantation of a three piece IOL uh, in the sulcus. I prefer to uh, put it in the anterior chamber first, then by the aid of Sineski hook to introduce it in the sulcus and then uh, to have a good fixation of uh, I, uh, this IOL in this situation I prefer to do optic capture it's very easy to done and finally I have injected um, my coal to constrict the pupil and removal of the OVD from the anterior chamber and wash of the residual lens matter and closure of the wounds by stromal hydration. And this was the final end of the case. Okay, thank you, Dr. Basim. Uh, unexpected events and complications may continue also after uneventful surgery late in post-operative period. So Dr. Ashraf Sharawi, uh, uh, let us see how it may happen lately uh, post-operative and how uh, to manage. Can you see my screen now? Yes. This is a 25 year old male patient with history of loss of vision following uh, hammering, uh, hammering with a nail. The visual axis is hand motion, and these segments show slit corneal self wound uh, with posterior subcapsular cataract. And I started doing combined uh, phaco and vitrectomy to extract the foreign body, uh, doing the uh, rexus in the retro 
elimination using the red reflex enhancer, implanting under IOL, the lens was seen to be stable. Uh, there was a rent, small rent in the posterior capsule, but I thought that this is very trivial and I can put a single piece IOL. I went back and found the forearm body to be stuck in the pars plana in the down and nasal area. Uh, very important, it removed the forearm body by manually, as you have seen in this uh, handshake technique, using two instruments so that you can align the foreign body during extraction along its long axis. <clears throat> um, so it can be removed easily along the axis of the foreign body. And another important trick is to enlarge the wound liberally so that you can extract the foreign body without being stuck in the in sclerotomy incision, causing problems and falling back into onto the surface surface of the retina, causing problem. And now the foreign body is out of the eye, <clears throat> and I thought that the problem had finished. Hydration of the wound, the lens is centered, the foreign body is out, the retina is flat. And post-operatively, uh, after laser of the site of the impact of the foreign body, the vision actually improved to 6-12. Uh, <clears throat> the, patient, the patient had disappeared for six months because he was out of town, and he returned back with a visual active of 160 and history of trial of lens exchange by another surgical facility due to the, the uh, allocation that the lens was subluxated and fold back out of the center. The patient came to me with an affected position, and as you can see, there are sutures in the wound. A PMMA lens was tried to be implanted in the sulcus, so I have to remove this PMMA lens, the C6.5, through an incision. And since I had to enlarge the incision, the decision here was not a Yaman technique, but an artisan with retro pupillary fixation, since I had opened uh, the, the incision to this extent. And you stretch the iris at the start of uh, your maneuver to be sure that the iris can be, uh, uh, that, that the pupil can be stretched. Um, and can be uh, closed. And now the artisan lens in, is being fixed in the retro pupillary uh, space, trying to enclavate the, the lens at the iris uh, uh, root. As you can see, the enclavation in the retro uh, uh, iris space is very easy, and you have to be sure uh, that the lens is centered uh, in the center of the pupil. And finally, uh, a stretching of the iris mechanically to be sure that the lens is well centered and you have no problem with uh, the pupil. And the patient regained his vision 2.4. Uh, this case is presented to show that if you have a small rent in the posterior capsule, you go for three-piece IOL from the start, no need for a single piece, and the affected correction during vitrectomy, primary or secondary uh, procedure, and the use of artisan versus Yemeni technique for three-piece lens uh, fixation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Let's move to the next sub, which is traumatic retinal detachment. The tears related to traumatic retinal detachment may vary from oral tears, a macular hole, joint retinal tear, or even dialysis. And the detachment may occur early, immediately after trauma or late from the onset of trauma. Uh, let's ask Dr. Hassan if traumatic retinal detachment associated with large macular hole. Do you deal with traumatic macular hole like idiopathic one, or you may do something different? 
دكتور حسن اوكي ثانك يو ماجد Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. Um, this is a, uh, after it, it is a 20, it is 15 year old. So this is 25, it's 15 year old girl with history of blunt trauma since one year. And then the, the girl started to complain of gradual diminution of vision since uh, three months. An examination revealed uh, visual acuity of hand motion, posterior cortical cataract, um, long-standing vitreous hemorrhage, uh, total retina detachment, multiple star-shaped folds, and uh, a large macular hole. Uh, this is the picture at the uh, time of operation. So this is the removal of the old standing hemorrhage. And then I injected uh, transnerone, and um, I did not find any uh, posterior hyaloid. So I injected the brilliant blue and I started to um, fashion the uh, eye lamp flaps from different directions in order to uh, close the macular hole with a multi-layer um, eye lamp flaps. Uh, what I call the uh, envelope technique. But as I am doing the eye lamp uh, Peeling, I discovered that the posterior hyaloid is still uh, there, and um, I couldn't recognize it uh, with the use of trans alone. But um, this is how the posterior hyaloid was uh, rather strongly adherent to the underlying retina, and this is expected because of the young age uh, of the uh, of the patient. So. Um, Uh, it was dissected uh, to the posterior border of the vitreous base um, using forceps. And um, then I tried to um, move uh, more peripheral and with the use of uh, uh, the aspiration from the cutter, then PFCL was injected to stabilize the posterior retina. Um, and um, Then I continued uh, peeling or fashioning the flaps in order to uh, cover the macular hole. Uh, this section of the uh, eye lamb uh, was continued until uh, the flaps could be brought over the uh, macular hole. Um, and I, at the end, I succeeded in covering the hole with the eye lamp flap, and then I extended the eye lamp peel. I got this free uh, eye lamp flap, and under the PFCL, and again, put some more eye lamp flaps. More PFCL is injected to deal with the retinal periphery. And um, the uh, posterior hyaloid was still aberrant. I could peel it from a posterior to anterior direction working toward the aura serrata or the posterior border of the vitreous base. And um, so that uh, the whole um, uh, posterior hyaloid could be uh, excised. Now the um, direct PFCL silicon oil exchange, the hole is uh, closed with the ILM multi-layer uh, flaps and the eye is filled with silicon oil and laser was applied to uh, the retinal pretreat for 360 degrees. Um, Post-operatively, uh, this, uh, I was recently operated, and the macular hole is closed, uh, silicon oil is still inside the eye, and the vision improved from hand motion to um, 0.16 uh, with correction. Thank you. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, uh, uh, for a very nice uh, case. So let us ask uh, Dr. Ashraf Harawi, in all the neglected uh, traumatic retina detachment, is there is a rule of electrophysiological test for surgery uh, decision making? And if you decide for surgery, do you modify your usual way in routine vitrectomy surgery in case, uh, uh, as you did, as you, as you usually do in rheumatogenous retina detachment? Dr. Ashraf? 
I think he, he has a problem. Dr. Ashraf? I think Ashraf uh, is not available here. Okay. Are you Ashraf. <laughs> Can you see now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think that active physiological test has a great importance. Uh, in uh, dealing with the decision uh, of uh, doing surgery or not, uh, because usually um, it gives us some sort of uh, uh, erroneous uh, decision. And I will show you in this case, which is a 40 year old uh, patient with a history of severe blunt trauma, dashboard one year ago, the vision is light perception. Actually he had undergone uh, some electrophysiological test before surgery, and it showed that the, the, the waves are extinguished, and there was no hope for surgery. That's why the patient uh, refrained from doing surgery all that time. He came with total lens opacity with an ultrasound showing total cataract and total retinal detachment. But at that time, the patient was motivated to do surgery. So we went to do uh, a combined phaco vitrectomy, and at the start, um, there was a total lens opacity which had dropped immediately to the posterior surface of the retina, removed by phaco fragmentor. The retina was shortened. After injection of PFC, the PFC had slipped back to the back of the retina, indicating that the retina is extremely uh, shortened. I've played not in full screen because there is problem with full screen. Um, so removal of the cataract by the phaco fragmenter. And as you can see, the retina is detached with a large break infratemporary. Injection of a bubble of PFC to stabilize the retina, but the PFC had slipped back behind the retina, indicating that the retina was shortened. And at that time, the decision was taken to uh, do a retinectomy and after taking all the PFC from behind the retina, which has slipped back due to the shortening of the retina, now more flattening of the retina, more injection of the, the PFC, there was a choroidal rupture in the center of the fovea with a scar, as you can see. But after flattening of the retina and applying a 360 degree uh, uh, laser to the edge of the retin retinectomy and the retina, and doing the laser under the silicon oil after silicon PFC exchange, direct silicon PFC exchange. I don't go back to air. This is the most safe way to deal with this patient to do this procedure till the last bubble of the PFC comes back from the surface of the back of the retina. As you can see, this is the edge of the bubble of the PFC uh, going away. The retina is flat and the temporary retinectomy is seen. The patient had his vision improved post-operatively to T260 uh, eccentric. Although he had a patient, a vision of light perception pre-operatively and the electrophysiological test uh, told us that there is no hope from the surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashraf, for this uh, case. Uh, in case of uh, bullous traumatic retinal detachment, the difficulties in creating a space to work in central vitreous and removal of epiretinal membranes can be managed by finding a space. By finding uh, a space, uh, sorry. By finding the tear, sorry, I'm sorry. By finding the tear or making early drainage retinotomy to drain the central retina, subretinal fluids. So, Dr. Sanjay, do you have another idea or trick to drain subretinal fluid early in order to make a space for working? Uh, 
Yes, Dr. Majid, I'm going to present another technique by which we do uh, controlled cannula drainage. And I'm specifically focusing on the post-traumatic cases. So this controlled cannula drainage is a drainage technique in which we use this intravenous cannula, 26-gate intravenous cannula to drain the fluid. So this patient was a uh, post-traumatic bullous detachment and hardly there was any space for performing any uh, vitreous surgery. So what we do is, so we take this intravenous catheter as far lim from limbus as possible and with bevel pointing away, we introduce this catheter inside the uh, subretinal space here. One, then we go inside, view the, that the catheter is in place and then we advance only the plastic tubing inside and remove the metallic part from the catheter. You can see the subretinal fluid is not coming out. After, after this, we connect this cannula to the extrusion pump of the vitrectomy machine and then we can put control the speed of the drainage. So here you can see once we start the drainage by the foot control, you see the retina going back. This is another patient. He had a post-traumatic uh, choroidal detachment and an intraocular foreign body. There was hardly any space to perform vitrectomy. Again, this was used. This technique was used. You can see this by uh, making a fast drainage, you can immediately collapse all the choroidals and create space. And once the choroidals are flat, flat, you just decrease the speed and to prevent the tissue incarceration. So this is how I uh, generally drain the subretinal fluid or choroidal detachments in a, a place where vitrectomy is not possible. Okay, uh, in case of supracroidal hemorrhage associated with retinal detachment, do you follow the same technique also, Dr. Sanjit? Sanjit? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not, I didn't get your... We don't hear you, Sanjit. Okay, uh, so I'll share another case. So, uh, are you seeing the screen now? Yes. So I'll share another case. This is a 65 years old female who presented to us 12 days after cataract surgery and she had the uh, with the retinal detachment and choroidal detachment, possibly a, some some part expulsive hemorrhage also, and there was a subretinal heme. So we introduced this control first. First of all, we introduced this 26 gauge cannula to drain the choroidals. So you can see a mixture of choroidal fluid and some blood coming out to the choroidals. And once the choroidals were settled, we made a small uh, sorry, a large retinectomy. First, we introduced this blush needle through a very small opening to drain all this subretinal fluid, the bulk of the subretinal fluid, so that it does not overspill into the vitreous and cause the media to get hazy. And once most of the fluid was drained, then we put in the perfluorocarbon liquid to settle the retina. and then do uh, further laser, 360 degree laser treatment and do a direct TFCL silicon oil exchange. And this is two months post-op patient that regained a good vision of six by 36, uh, two months post-operatively. So this is how uh, so this control cannula drainage helps in most cases of choroidal detachment and bullous retinal detachments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjit. I have a different way in drainage of subracroidal hemorrhage associated with uh, retinal detachment. You see now, uh, you see now my screen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. This, this is the case. 
This 60 years old patient falling on the ground, vision was PL, total lymphoma, ultrasound revealed vitreous hemorrhage, total detachment, supracranial hemorrhage, intraocular corneal body query. So I did for him PECO protect me. When I'm doing PECO, I found that blood coming from behind, which indicating how density of the blood hemorrhage behind the lens was. So I finalized my PECO procedures and delayed the implantation of IL for possible exit route for possible intraocular foreign body. I then insert the 23 gauge cannula inside the uh, vitreous cavity, but I withdraw a little uh, behind to be placed in the supracryoidal area and just press the valve of the, uh, the cannula with high infusion pressures to allow for passive drainage of the supracryoidal hemorrhage in the supracryoidal uh, area, and then replace the cannula in the vitreous cavity. And then after several uh, uh, seconds, working in a fog to remove the vitreous hemorrhage, I found the uh, retina folding upon itself and just attached to the global war by a small piece. So I uh, deal with this retina as if it is totally uh, a vulsive retina. I flattened the posterior bull of the retina, removed the, any uh, subretinal hemorrhage, and I do by manual uh, technique to remove the aberretinal membrane using two forceps at the edges of the uh, uh, torn retina and in the subretinal area. And I did uh, uh, ILM billing as I usually do in such cases. But in this case, I found the ILM is marginally adherent to the underlying retinal surface. So I uh, removed the ILM meticulously. At that point, I feeling that I'm feeling, I felt that the uh, retina may be torn and lacerated. So I hold the peeling in that, uh, at that point and continue my surgery as usual as briefly doing laser and uh, putting silicone oil at the end as a tamponade. And this is the uh, preoperative uh, uh, picture with PL and after uh, surgery and division was eccentric, three meters 0.05 after uh, silicone removal in these cases. So let's move. Uh, Dr. Weil, if you have traumatic vitreous hemorrhage with underlying uh, uh, giant retinal tear, not detected clinically, do you wait for resolution of vitreous hemorrhage or you will go for surgery? When would you operate uh, at first? Uh, I usually try to operate as early as possible because um, early intervention, whenever possible, whenever that permits, uh, enables the, the surgeon to um, manipulate the tissues before the stage of uh, fibrous tissue formation, which makes it uh, more difficult. And in the same time, we may prevent some of the lines of treatment uh, or the management of trauma is to prevent uh, further tissue damage. So in this case, for example, who is a gentleman who were exposed to a blunt trauma while playing football with his friends. He developed a vitreous hemorrhage. And when he presented to me, he presented to me after four days with just vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, the ultrasound, he performed an ultrasound. I didn't ask for the ultrasound at the time, but he performed it and it showed there is nothing attached retina. I decided to intervene. And um, uh, after clearing out the vitreous hemorrhage, uh, I found out that there is a peripheral giant retinal tear. Uh, even though you can see that 99% of the retina is attached. But after uh, clearing out the vitreous hemorrhage and moving to the periphery, I found out, I suspected is that the dialysis or a giant retinal tear, but I found out that the retina is extremely lacerated in this area. And once I get close to that part, I uh, I found that, okay, so I am lucky and he is lucky because uh, this tear inevitably would have turned into a retinal detachment within a complete retinal detachment within a week or two. And if I wait for one month with the hope that the vitreous hemorrhage resolves, uh, I think he will definitely develop a PVR along the edges of that uh, giant retinal tear. So uh, I, you see the management is easy. Uh, and. Well, and the outcome was fine. But 
if I waited for some time for the vitreous hemorrhage to resolve, I think I would have experienced a more difficult situation, which I will present later in a video after a few presentations. Uh, and so I want to focus in this video. I, my message here is to, okay, uh, intervene as early as possible and don't underestimate the vitreous hemorrhage, even if it doesn't look like a total vitreous hemorrhage or an organized vitreous hemorrhage. It may hide behind it a, a retinal, a huge retinal tear like this one. Uh, and you see that it is a lacerated tear. I, I had to uh, amalgamate to mix the breaks, the lacerations into a one giant retinal tear and to trim the edges as possible as I can to turn it into a clean giant retinal tear and to remove the vitreous hemorrhage. There's another one point here. The removal of a vitreous hemorrhage that is relatively fresh at the level of the vitreous base looks much easier uh, when we do it in the fresh stage, when we wait and, or when we operate on an organized vitreous hemorrhage, there is usually a problem where I don't feel safe, even if I try to trim as possible as I can from that organized hemorrhage at the level of the vitreous base. Uh, and so this is also was another chance that I remove all vitreous hemorrhage and to dissect the vitreous base meticulously as possible as I can. And to inspect, of course, the retinal periphery all around to make sure there are no breaks. So this is the benefit of early intervention in such cases. Thank you so much. This is Thank you, Wael. Traumatic retinal detachment with retinal dialysis is different form of giant is different from giant retinal tear and it can be nicely management with external procedure like a buckle. But in presence of BVR, the management may be different. So may I ask Dr. Ashraf Shaharawi, is there is a rule of vitrectomy in case of dialysis? Well, <clears throat> I, I, can't, I don't think that there is any role of vitrectomy in single uh, uh, detachment or simple detachment due to uh, retinal dialysis. Still, uh, patients can get a very good prognosis uh, by doing just uh, a buckle as you, I'm going to show you in this case. Uh, this is a patient who had a history of blunt trauma uh, three months ago with gradual progressive diminution of vision with a visual axis of 0.05 and anterior segment was free. This was his detachment with dialysis infratemporal and some demarcation line indicating the chronicity of uh, the condition. Uh, <clears throat> he had undergone Uh, a simple uh, procedure, chandelier assisted buckling. And as you can see, while clearing the pressing, the periphery of the retina, you can see the dialysis very clearly, apply the cryo to the edge of the dialysis very accurately. And you can see the detachment of the vitreous base, the so-called bucket handle appearance, very clearly seen during the procedure. And after application of the cryo, you just apply uh, an encircling uh, 41 band to the area of the dialysis. And you drain the subretinal fluid. And in spite of the fact that the detachment was chronic for three months, with some degeneration of the periphery of the retina and the central macula, after drainage of the uh, retina, of the subretinal fluid, the retina went back to its position and the subretinal fibrosis didn't affect the reattachment of the retina and the long-term uh, visual activity of the patient was preserved and at the same time, you didn't uh, uh, give the pa this patient any danger of getting cataract and he was a young patient to get cataract and loss of his accommodation by doing any uh, vitreous uh, surgery. Actually, this was after injection of gas and reformation of the globe after drainage of the subretinal fluid. And this was the post-operative appearance of the patient. And in spite of the fact there was lines of demarcation of the old detachment, the retina was attached with good macular uh, function. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf.
sometimes the ocular trauma uh, affects the most variable area in the retina, which is, of course, the macula, and may lead to macular hole, which may be isolated or associated with retinal detachment. Hemorrhage in the submacular area or in the sub ILM area or in the sub, even in sub hyaloid area above the macula. So may I ask the uh, Dr. Weil, in case of traumatic macular hole, what is the time of intervention and if the size of the hole buys your decision making or not? Well, I think the main point in the timing for intervention for uh, traumatic macular hole depends on the age. In the pediatric age group, we would rather wait for one month because there is a chance for spontaneous closure of the macular hole. But for adults, I don't think it takes the same natural history. And so it would be better to intervene uh, whenever possible, as early as possible for adults. The technique is the same for idiopathic macular hole. Uh, we usually, of course, we induce a PVD. I like first, uh, I do it like Professor Mutata, I like to induce the posterior vitreous detachment without the use of trimsin alone in the beginning. And I may re-inject again if I feel there is a vitreous schizis. But the difference is that I like to perform or to fashion the INM flap under PFCL. Um, and my rationale is based on the literature which talks about two configurations for the ILM uh, in the macular hole. When I do it under PFCL, it takes the style of a pile of sheets. So it is, they are a layer of, um, layers of sheets inside the hole, which makes it more or less more homogeneous and to act as a substrate for the uh, a probable uh, mitosis and migration for the Muller cells, which help not only with the closure, but with a functional, some functional improvement that may be expected. And the other point that it uh, makes the surgeon quite sure during the surgery and after the surgery that there is no possible retroversion of the flap and that the flap will always be tucked inside the hole in a flat manner. The tick here is that during the uh, fluid air exchange, the PFCL air exchange, to do it gradually and gently, and to start from the periphery, as was demonstrated in the video, uh, uh, from the periphery to the posterior pole, until when I'm at the level of the optic disc, I'm quite uh, safe, I feel safe, that they, when once the PFCL is removed, the flaps will not retrovert, and there is no risk to uh, get uh, into the vitrectomy port. Um, but more or less, it goes in the same lines as in idiopathic macular hole. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Ashraf Sharawi, if you have a patient with macular hemorrhage, how do you, do, how do you localize the level of the hemorrhage? Whether is it uh, sub ILM, sub macular hemorrhage, or even in sub hyaloid area? And if it is in subhyaloid uh, regions, what is the timing of surgical intervention if you want to do it? Or do you think is YAG laser hyalotomy is a good alternative rather than surgery? Well, I will show you in this uh, case presentation um, uh, how can I localize uh, this uh, issue uh, during, before, surg before surgery on the OCT and again uh, during the surgery while uh, staining the different levels of the vitreous and the retina. This is a 30-year-old female pregnant in the second trimester with history of preeclampsia and severe vomiting and presented with drop of vision in the right eye and teeth. There was a spot of hemorrhage, a big spot of, a spot of hemorrhage in the center of the fovea and you can see that the, at the edges of this hemorrhage, the hemorrhage in part is subretinal, but in some part it's pre-retinal, and there is a glistening cyst overlying the area of the hemorrhage and circumscribing the area of the hemorrhage. With this wall of the cyst very glistening, which is classic of the ILM. So this is a case of ILM, uh, sub-ILM hemorrhage, and I usually prefer to go for a vitrectomy. I don't like doing YAG laser hyalidotomy. And this is the OST showing the level of uh, the hemorrhage uh, on the OST with backscattering on the underlying structures of the retina 
This is the preoperative still image of the case. During the vitreous surgery, as you can see, go for vitrectomy. First, staining of the posterior hyaloid. And you can see very clearly the vice ring. And even after you completely detach the posterior hyaloid and uh, uh, the blood didn't move a bit, indicating that this hemorrhage is at a level deeper than the level of the posterior hyaloid. Again, complete removal of posterior hyaloid. Still, the hemorrhage is encapsulated in front of the fovea, trauma, trying to make a hole in the internal limiting membrane using a tannous scrapper or an ILM forceps. There is another part of the hemorrhage at the edge of the cyst, which is subretinal. Finally, a hole is opened in the ILM and all the blood comes out of this hole. The hole enlarged just by using the flute needle as a forceps, detaching uh, the ILM to the periphery and the blood just in a second floats inside the vitreous cavity and you remove it by suction and by uh, cutting with the, uh, the vitreous cutter. <clears throat> and you have to remove the vitreous to the vitreous periphery. And though, although this patient was fecking, you still can shave the vitreous base soon, since you are doing by manual surgery and clearer depression helps you to do that without endangering the periphery of the lens. And this is the post-operative appearance the hemorrhage, which is a sub-ILM, is gone, and the edge of the ILM attachment is still present. There are some patches of sub-retinal uh, hemorrhage, which clears in few months following the surgery. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, for this case, I have also a, a case of submacular hemorrhage uh, in a child with macular hole. Let us see this very short case. This is 15 years old boy with traumatic macular hole and some macular hemorrhage. Vision was counting finger, and this is preoperative uh, OCT. I did for him a complete vitrectomy as usual with veiling of the posterior hyaloid, and I inject a TPA with a, a 41 gauge needle in a dose of 25 microgram in 0.1 milli in different sites, and then I did an ILM veiling uh, uh, with inverted flare technique and the gas injection at the first with SF6. This is pre and post operative uh, image with marvelous improvement of the vision up to 0.8 post operative. Let's move. Uh, surgery for perforating eye injuries cause severe ocular morbidity with poor visual and anatomical outcome as well. And this may relate to BVR formation, which developed as a result of retinal pigment epithelial proliferation and fibrous proliferation from the wound. So let's ask Dr. Hassan, what do you do in these cases to avoid or decreasing the incidence of BVR formation from inside of the wound of perforating injuries? Dr. Hassan? Yes, Megan. Um... Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, this is a 35 year old male um, who sustained a penetrating trauma with a gunshot since three weeks before presentation. Ultrasound examination and CT revealed that the foreign body or the, the gunshot is outside the globe. It revealed the, the presence of vitreous hemorrhage, total retinal detachment, and the, the visual acuity was hand motion. This is at the time of surgery. This is the exit wound. So I started the surgery with um, cataract and implantation of a phaco and implantation of fossil chamber lens, removal of the vitreous hemorrhage, which was extensive. And um, after removing the hemorrhage, there was a total retina detachment. I tried to detach the posterior hyaloid. Uh, which was still attached in spite of the trauma and the hemorrhage 
and this may be related to the young age of the patient. The posterior hyaloid was removed, and you can see that the, the retina is fixed in this direction, and there are um, vitreous and incarceration, hemorrhage incarceration, and um, this is the site of the posterior exit wound. The preretinal blood was removed, and then um, while the uh, retina is relatively fixed at the site of incarceration, uh, I started uh, peeling the internal limiting membrane. And in these cases, I like to peel the ILM up to the exit wound. PFCL is injected, and you can see how the subretinal uh, blood is displaced. This is the site of exit wound or incarceration. Um, diathermy, heavy diathermy is applied to uh, perform chorioretinectomy um, uh, in order to um, destroy the tissues uh, and relieve the, uh, the incarceration of the vitreous and the retina. And this is a, uh, as suggested by first by Zivanovic and then by Ferenc Kuhn. Um, it is a proactive measure in order to uh, decrease post-operative uh, PVR. And I strongly believe in this technique. After um, relieving the uh, incarceration and um, releasing the retina from the incarceration, the base retractomy was performed, removing the peripheral vitreous hemorrhage and the vitreous gel and um, cleaning the vitreous base. This is um, how, uh, and I, um, I like to cut the retina with the side of the probe. And um, I, uh, I felt that this part of the retina is uh, relatively immobile. So I extended the uh, retinotomy uh, uh, to one or two clock hours to release the retina. The subretinal blood was completely uh, removed. Um, then laser was applied, and um, uh, finally, uh, PFCL was exchanged with uh, silicon oil. Uh, Postoperatively, the retina was attached. There was no proliferation, and the cut um, and the, the, the site of the retinotomy was clean and quiet. And this is the uh, advantage of doing chorioretinectomy in these eyes with a deep impact or. Um, perforating uh, exit wound. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Dr. Sanjit, I know that you follow the same technique. So let me ask uh, first, if the site of perforation near the large blood vessels or near the fovea in the central area, what do you do in these cases? Do you follow the same technique or you change a little bit or modify it? Dr. Majid, uh, just to start this case, just to show the relevance of chorioretinectomy, I uh, show this case, which is a patient. Uh, understand the concept of chorioretinectomy. A young boy who had post-traumatic double perforation and uh, endophthalmitis. So we started with lensectomy in this patient and the removal of the exudates which were present in the interior chamber. And we cleared the entry wound of all the exudates were there, that were there. Then we sutured this entry wound. So this was a patient who had endophthalmitis. Now we cleared all the hemorrhage and exudates in the posterior chamber also. And once we cleared the posterior chamber, this was the exit wound. It was along the inferior temporal vessel here, just close to the disc. And but two months post-operatively, you can see the what had happened. We did not do a chorioretinectomy large fibrotic membrane which has developed uh, from, uh, from this exit wound and if it was extending over to the fovea and the vision was just counting fingers one meter in this patient. So uh, now what, now this again. So after the second sitting, uh, we removed the membrane along with the ILM. And once we had eaten up this membrane, we did this 100% deep diathermy burned around this exit wound. 
we was we spared the major retinal vessels here we did not uh, do the diathermy over the vessels again we did deep diathermy burns over the choroid to melt away the choroid and expose the sclera below and we also used with technique cutter to uh, expose uh, to eat up the choroid and expose the sclera but again we spared the major retinal vessels here did not uh, cut them or try to remove them any major bleeding which was seen was uh, again cauterized vessels were cauterized from where the bleeding was come or the bottle was raised to stop the bleeding yes so after this we injected a short acting gas we also did a bit of laser around this choroidectomy site one to two rows of laser can be done around this choroidectomy site and after this we did a fluid air exchange and short acting sf6 gas was injected in this patient so to again 20 days post op the patient's vision had improved to 6 by 24 there was no recurrence and two months post operatively the patient vision had improved to 6 by 18 though there were some intraretinal hemorrhages present due to air but it was not affecting the vision much there was no recurrence seen thank you Thank you, Dr. Sanjit. Uh, yes, can... Why choroidectomy becomes important in these type of patients with deep uh, trauma? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sanjit. Bit retinal incarceration may be different from posterior perforation, especially if it's associated with penetrating trauma with sharp object. And I have a case with bit retinal incarceration with sharp uh, foreign body and associated with retinal detachments. Let us uh, see this case. Uh, this uh, 35 years old patient with trauma during cutting ceramic edges during his work with rupture globe and immediate uh, cornea repair and ultrasound revealed vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment and intraocular foreign body. After working in the vitreous cavity, removing the vitreous hemorrhage, I found a reddish reflex and at first I suspected that it is a, a area of clotted hemorrhage. But when I, re I removed the old hemorrhage, I realized that it is a big uh, reddish uh, foreign body. So I enlarged the, uh, the sclerotomy and dealt with the foreign body, tried to dislodge it from the global wall with the forceps and the grasp it with the foreign body forceps, delivered it in the anterior chamber. And with the left hand, I uh, uh, enlarged the, uh, about the I one. Want. And they tried to remove it with the basket forceps, but I failed. I enlarged the cornea wound also as well and grasp the foreign body with the uh, tying forceps and remove it from the cornea and close the cornea with the suture. Then return back to the uh, fundus to see what, what would happen. I found that there is incarceration of the vitreous and the retina and I by manually uh, tried to remove these uh, tissue incarcerated inside the wound and after removing the old tissue and trimming the edges of the retinal incarcerations and uh, uh, doing a laser around this uh, area of incarcerations and retinal wounds and the deal uh, as, uh, as usual with a routine vitectomy for rheumatogenous detachment. This is my case. Then we, uh, we, we shall move Dr. Sanjit, uh, you have a similar case of vitreal incarceration with sharp knife. Let us see this other uh, challenge in your case. Thank you, Dr. Majid. Uh, this continuing with the choreoretinectomy cases. This was a patient, 32 years old, female, uh, male patient who had uh, this knife injury during a fight. Ended up with a vitreous hemorrhage with total retinal detachment and a large area of vitreous incarceration. So again, what we did was we first removed the vitreous hemorrhage. We did a complete vitrectomy, including the base excision. After removing the vitreous, then again, 100% diathermy burns were given. 
around this vitreous incarceration site uh, and the retinectomy was done. The retina was totally freed from this incarceration site. After uh, retinectomy, we proceeded with the chororetinectomy. In this case, we did not remove whole of the choroid, but we created a one millimeter bare sclera uh, around the vitreous incarceration site. Because it was a large vitreous incarceration, it was not possible to remove whole of the choroid hair. So we just created an area all around this vitreous incarceration one millimeter of bare sclera here. Again, the bleeding that was taken care of by the diathermy only. After this, we did a fluid gear, air exchange to settle the retina. Did a 360 degree barrage laser and we also did a laser around the retina acne site. We exchanged air with silicon oil again, and this is three months post-operatively. The patient's retina was attached. Silicon oil was removed at this stage, and one year post-op, patient had a relatively good vision of 6 by 36. Thank you, Dr. Sanjit. Uh, if retinal detachment is treated with orbital wall fracture with muscle entrapment, especially if it's treated with impacted foreign body and the fracture of the retina around as well, so uh, limitation of eye mobility during vitrectomy add more difficulties and challenge. So Dr. Whale, you have a case similar. So uh, let us see your challenge and how you, you do this, uh, how you did this surgery. So of course, we are all focused on the, uh, the challenges uh, within the retinal detachment itself, especially if there is a vitreoretinal incarceration and especially if it was uh, there was a long duration between the initial injury and the timing of presentation. But in this case, I had an additional difficulty that the boy had a deformity in the face due to an, an extensive orbital floor, uh, orbital wall rupture. And I, so I suspected that I, will, uh, I may face the problem that there is muscle entrapment and enophthalmus that may not help me during the tilting of the globe and end. And I experienced this from the beginning. The local anesthesia for this uh, child produced uh, a lot of chemosis. I had to do a periotomy in the beginning to see, well, my destination. Uh, when I entered at the upper, upper position of the trochers, I found out that it is very difficult. I have to tilt the globe each and every time. So I turned into more uh, along the horizontal meridian. Inside the globe, I found that there is a mixture of Combined traction and rheumatogenous retinal detachment due to the vitreo retinal, the posterior perforation and the vitreo retinal incarceration, the organized vitreous hemorrhage. And as you see, there is a giant retinal tear of more than 180 degrees. Um, the first task here was to uh, separate the, uh, the organized vitreous hemorrhage uh, and to eliminate the traction that it produces uh, so that I would. Uh, focus on the underlying uh, retinal detachment. Uh, I usually use chandelier, of course, in all the cases. My task here was uh, an attempt to isolate the area of vitreo retinal incarceration from the surrounding parts. So I had to, through a bimanual manipulation with the forceps on the left hand, and uh, to use the endodiathermy all around this area uh, of the retina uh, as possible as I can to diathermize and to elevate the infusion bottle so that I would control any intra or to prevent any intraocular hemorrhage that may uh, happen uh, during the stage of the isolation, and then try to uh, flatten the retina with the fluorocarbon liquid and to check whether the periphery in the periphery there is a PVR or not, because the timing between the injury and the presentation was two months. And this is, of course, uh, a little bit too long. 
uh, I found out that it is safer for me to uh, complete the retinectomy 360 degrees and to uh, eliminate any part of the contracted retina to make sure that the peripheral stump of the retina also is completely eliminated. Of course, the tilting was limited because of the muscle entrapment, but I tried as possible as I can to figure things out for myself and to perform a 360 uh, laser retinectomy. Um, the next step is usually, I know, debatable because I like to, to perform a PFCL air exchange in the beginning and then to do a siliconoid injection under air. But I, uh, my tip is that I try to keep my probe at the interface uh, peripheral to the retinectomy edges so that I am sure before reaching the edge of the retinectomy and to avoid slippage to make sure that the retina is completely attached. And at the end, I inject silicon oil, injected silicon oil. Of course, there is some inevitable bleeding despite all the efforts, but uh, hopefully it uh, is limited as possible as we can. This was the best out of it for me. So what do you think? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weil, uh, for this uh, nice case. And uh, uh, we uh, will move to the surprise of ocular trauma. Uh, the ocular trauma may be treated with surprise, of course, in either an anterior segment or posterior segment as well. So, uh, Dr. Bessim, do you face with surprise in dealing with anterior segment trauma case? And if you have a case, uh, let us show it. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Dr. Megan, again. Uh, this is a case I operated last Friday, a uh, week ago. Uh, it's a 56 years old male uh, who received trauma. Uh, by a wooden stick while chasing a rat. Uh, on examination, uh, the visual acuity was hand motion with good projection, corneal edema, uh, evidence of aphakia, uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage with conjunctival chemosis. The AC was deep, except uh, for a part of the iris which was adherent to the back of the cornea. Uh, CT orbit showed suspected extrusion of the lens which was seen as a rounded white mass extraocular. So here is a video of the case. Uh, I decided to go for exploration under the conjunctiva 360 degree polyotomy and the sclera was surprisingly intact. 360 degrees intact sclera. So uh, at this position, I decided to, I suspected posterior rupture or something like this. So I decided to do uh, reposition of the uh, iris uh, for preparation of the future implantation secondary IL, but surprisingly, there was a mass moving inside the anterior chamber. You can see the edge of this mass. This mass, you can rotate it. You can see the pigments while it is, uh, there is friction between it and the back of the iris. So I realized that this is anteriorly dislocated crystalline lens. Uh, it was clear uh, despite the age of the patient. Uh, so I opened a clear corneal wound um, as for extra capsular and delivered this crystalline lens through a corneal wound. You can see how it, uh, it is clear. Uh, then I did uh, anterior vitrectomy uh, as usual. You can see that the iris. Uh, uh, now is in normal uh, position, uh, more and more anterior vitrectomy, and uh, by the aid of the triamycinone to be sure that there is no uh, any vitreous or residual vitreous in the anterior chamber. And final, finally, I close the wound as usual by continuous uh, uh, nine zero, uh, sorry, 10 zero nylon uh, suture. Um, for preparation for secondary implantation IOF. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Basim. Uh, I have also surprised in different scenario uh, uh, in the posterior segment. Let's see this case. Uh, very short case. This is 11 years of old, uh, old boy with trauma, uh, uh, with the history of dimensional vision Two months patient dry in history of trauma, uh, vision was hand motions and uh, funnel shape detachments. I plan to do fake uh, uh, lensectomy, vitrectomy in this case. 
and as usual, removal of epiretinal membranes. And after removal, I found that there was extensive intrinsic shorting of the retina doing retinotomy, and I found yellowish area, yellowish roads. And when I grasped it, I found that it was a foreign body, and I removed the foreign body through the anterior chamber also. Uh, and I surprised because I operated upon this eye uh, uh, as if it is a retinal detachment only. And after removal of the foreign body, I, uh, 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 when the parents, sorry, When his parents uh, saw the foreign body uh, I removed, they remembered that the child received a mild trauma six months before with just redness and resolved after a few days. And uh, unfortunately, I opened this eye as if it is a old standing detachment with a closed funnel and found at the end that it had a, a subretinal uh, foreign body. Then let's move to uh, last stop uh, and uh, as uh, usual, in any celebrations, uh, there is uh, uh, fireworks. All of us like to see the fireworks to show, uh, uh, show in any celebrations, and it makes us very happy to see it, but in some situations may make someone miserable with its explosions. So Dr. Hassan, let us see what's going on in your case with uh, uh, fire sh or fireworks show explosions. Thank you, Megid. Um, this is uh, a 35 year old male um, who was doing fireworks, and uh, all of a sudden, one of the um, uh, one of them uh, exploded into his face, and he came with um, this picture. There was an iridolysis. Uh, this was at the primary pair, which is not that good. And there was uh, severe hypotony. So I have to uh, reform the globe. And I, re and I sutured the um, areodialysis. And um, because uh, waiting for uh, some time will render the iris rigid. And I think this is the proper time for uh, reconstruction of the anterior segment. Cataract was done, uh, an IOL was implanted, and um, these are the two pieces of uh, the fire work that was found inside the eye vitreous hemorrhage, total retinal detachment. And as you see, the um, mobility of the retina is hindered in this area. And um, at once you have to suspect the presence of retinal incarceration. The hemorrhage was uh, removed. The posterior hyaloid was detached. And um, until I reached this para, papillary uh, retinal incarceration. Um, again, uh, the heron was used to displace the, um, the two pieces, the two foreign bodies, and um, one following the other was grasped with the forceps, uh, extracted through another uh, sclerotomy. Um, and then, the large sclerotomy was sutured. And then we start to deal with the uh, deep impact wound because there was another piece uh, that penetrated the eye in this area. Chorotinectomy was performed. And, um, and the frame was applied. I tried to uh, de release the incarcerated retina. Um, 
from the site of incarceration, removing, so um, uh, uh, it was impossible, of course, to apply more diathermy because it was very close to the optic nerve. But uh, anyhow, I could apply diathermy to the site of incarceration. And um, actually, this patient is from uh, Yemen, and the patient traveled to his country. And he was followed there by um, the referring doctor. And um, I received uh, reports that the retina is attached and silicon oil was removed in uh, Yemen. And then I, I lost any uh, Inform any more information about this patient. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, uh, very much for this uh, beautiful presentations and uh, thanks for all the speakers. Finally, uh, 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 I want to, uh, to send a take-home message from uh, everyone just in, uh, in, uh, in, in a word or in a sentence uh, for a junior staff or uh, other colleagues uh, starting with uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, can you uh, tell us uh, as a home as a, as a take home message in our advice for the junior staff and doctors? Um, first of all, the timing of uh, intervention, as we said, primary repair should be done immediately. Sometimes it is not only primary repair, but you have to relieve uh, incarceration in the wound. Um, uh, making a localized vitrectomy to remove the tract uh, if it is a uh, perforating injury. Um, and then uh, the, the, the lens, uh, if it is disrupted, it should have to be also removed. And then uh, give the patient, uh, of course, you have to follow the rules for suturing of the cornea, which should be uh, well coapted. And then um, you stay, I think you have to wait for um, 10 to 15 uh, days um, in order to re-evaluate the condition, perform ultrasound, CT, um, and um, also to explain the situation to the patient. The only exception for that is the presence of a copper foreign body. Uh, second intervention should be 10 to 15 uh, days. And um, I think that you have to do all what you should do for the patient because I don't like to reoperate several times. So if there is deep impact wound, you have to uh, do chorioretinectomy. And I think primary chorioretinectomy is more um, uh, effective in preventing or uh, as a pro proactive measure in preventing epiretinal and subretinal proliferation. These cases are at high risk uh, of developing this proliferation. Um, the retina, the, the vitreous cavity should be completely cleaned. The vitreous hemorrhage has to be cleaned. Um, the retina should be attached. All breaks should be treated. And um, I prefer in severe injury uh, to, to inject silicon oil. It is not necessarily heavy silicon, but inject silicon oil. It gives uh, proper monitoring of the, of the case. You can monitor the case. Uh, the, the, the visual re rehabilitation is earlier than the use of C3, F8, for example. Um, and then this patient may need visual rehabilitation. Combining FACO with a vitrectomy depends on the case, the age of the patient, the severity of the condition. So it is not always you have to combine. You may postpone um, cataract surgery to another uh, session, but iris repair should be done in the same session because after um, some time, as Matthew showed us, um, the iris is atrophic. Um, it's not stretchable. You cannot repair the iris. So um, these cases need uh, uh, devotion, commitment, and uh, you have to spend much time trying to save uh, this eye. And I, I, I felt that um, all the speakers have the same um, uh, feeling that these, every attempt and every effort should be made to save these eyes, especially in the pediatric age group 
and in the productive age group. Thank you, Maggie, for arranging this, organizing this uh, beautiful and uh, Thank you. Uh, very informative uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to have uh, to have you, Dr. Hassan, always. Uh, Dr. Ashraf Sharawi. Well, uh, first of all, we have to spend a lot of time with the patient and the family of the patient, uh, explaining every bit of the surgery for them and the complication. Uh, trauma cases are open to all the type of the complications. The need for more than one surgery, as Professor Hassan and uh, and you, Maggie, had shown us, that uh, the, the, it's open for every intervention, especially with retinal conditions, which have a tendency for reproliferation even after very neat uh, surgery. Uh, again, uh, you have to be prepared before the surgery for all the surprises. You have to be prepared for the different type of lenses for retropupillary fixation. You have to be prepared with the Aman three-piece lens because you don't know the situation except actually during the surgery. So it's a very challenging case, not like uh, the, any regular uh, retinal detachment case. You have to be prepared for the surprises like getting a foreign body, which you didn't pre-estimate before the surgery. So this is one of the most challenging cases of uh, uh, the ophthalmic practice. And I advise my junior to do the surgery in the best circumstances, in the best OR, with the best equipment, and with the, all the weapons be prepared to deal with the, with the condition. Finally, I would thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Eva, for this nice, very informative panel. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Dr. Sanjit? Thank you, Dr. Majid, for making me a part of this program. And uh, Dr. Hassan and Dr. Sharavi has quite uh, rightly summed up the whole thing. I would just like to add one thing, that because most of these trauma cases are medical legal cases, so we also need to take care uh, regarding that uh, issue. And we have to make a proper documentation, proper record keeping, and proper consents have to be maintained uh, according to the law of the country, uh, whatever it is. And uh, we have to be prepared for that also. Thank you, Dr. Madhya. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Dr. Mateo? Well, it was a great pleasure to stay with you tonight. And thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's always great to learn from uh, your videos, from your experiences. Every time I learn so much. So thank you. It was my privilege to stay here with you. Thank you, Matteo. Dr. Ashraf Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Maggid, uh, for this uh, inform highly informative uh, webinar. Uh, as any case of trauma, the medical consent is very important. And uh, uh, also to tell the patient and the uh, the relatives, everything in details, because uh, the end result of any case of trauma is not the usual end result of any normal case. Uh, as still, there is a hope we can reach a safe land with the cases. Uh, also, in this complicated case, you, think, you must think twice and always make a plan A and plan B for these cases uh, and always uh, prepare all your arrangements for your plans. Uh, in complicated traumatic cases, always be cool because you may end in a wonderful result. Uh, this is my message to, for everyone. Okay, thank, thank you. you Maggie, so much, uh, and thank you for everyone. Thank you, Ashraf. Uh, Dr. Weil? Well, uh, I think everybody has, has mentioned everything. I would just uh, assert uh, the fact that uh, to hurry up as possible as we can with the primary repair and as possible as we can with the second repair, but not to hurry with finishing all the tasks in one surgery. It is a staged approach. We can take our, our time in the several steps. The second point is that, uh, yes, we are repairing damaged tissue, but we need to put in mind also during the management to make sure that we prevent further damage or future damage uh, in these cases. Thank you again for being with you all. It was uh, such a great uh, webinar with uh, marvelous speakers and uh, Professors. Thank you, well, uh, Dr. Basim. You are muted, uh, Dr. Basim. 
mute. Sorry, uh, thank you, Dr. Maggot, for uh, this uh, great webinar. Uh, just I uh, would like to mention that initial evaluation of a patient with eye trauma should be as complete as possible because decisions about diagnosis and treatment options depends on the initial evaluation. Also, careful history is important and the visual equity should be obtained for prognostic and legal reasons. Uh, thank you all and thank you, Dr. Maggot, for this great informative one uh, webinar. Thank you, Dr. Basim. Uh, finally, uh, uh, my, uh, my take home message is uh, uh, any traumatizing eye looks like a surprise, surprising package. So I have to have uh, all things ready. I have to expect unexpected events for all cases, even apparently simple cases. I have to have all things. Chandelier should be ready. My manual technique should be ready. Everything should be ready. I have to expect unexpected things. And finally, I would like to, say, I would like to thank all of you uh, uh, for this enriched, informative sessions. And a special thank to uh, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Ashraf Sharawi, Dr. Matteo, Dr. Sanjit, Dr. Uh, Wael, Dr. Ashraf Armia, Dr. Basim Pais. Uh, I, I thanks all of you. And finally, thanks to Eva Farm, who uh, sponsored us. And uh, uh, hopefully to meet you again uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Hope to meet you soon.